Before I um, start, I need to take a roll call. Um, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am here. Good morning. Um, I am looking for Commissioner. Oh, there she is. Commissioner Brown. Yep, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. And Commissioner Zuniga. Good morning. Yes, good morning, everybody. I'm here. We're all set. And thank you, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, for taking time out on this, on this day. I know it's been a, a lengthy meeting for a vacation day, so thank you. Um, as you know, everyone, we're able to uh, to gather today virtually because of, of relief that has been granted by the governor through his emergency orders in light of the pandemic that provide um, the opportunity for um, some relief from the open meeting law. We've been able to do that since uh, March of 2020. Today is uh, May 20th, 2021, and it is public meeting number 344. Um, I'm going to call to order. But before we get started on the minutes, I just want to say that um, I wanted to provide an update as to the Commission's anticipated plans and actions in light of the CDC's new guidance and the governor's announcement on um, and order on Monday. The Gaming Commission will hold a special public meeting at 10 a.m. next Wednesday, May 26. This will follow our planned agenda setting meeting, which will now be scheduled for 9 a.m. Representatives of the three licensees uh, and harnessing, uh, horse racing and uh, simulcasting will attend and participate. We anticipate the agenda will address the following three items. The NPC adopted COVID-19 guidelines relating related to the gaming establishments. The MGC approved COVID-19 plans relating, relating to horse racing and simulcasting. The impact of the governor's order on the commission's future use of remote collaborative technology, uh, given the governor's emergency order offering public bodies like ours, the relief that I just mentioned from certain provisions of the open meeting law during the pandemic. So that will be scheduled for 10 a.m. next week. And I thank all the members of the team who worked so hard earlier this week uh, with me to come up with these plans in the night of Monday's order. Also of note for today's agenda, yesterday we did post a, an amendment to today's agenda. Uh, we will not be addressing a particular horse racing item. It had been previously marked up as item 5E. We will be addressing that as a future meeting. It did in, involve a collection of public comments, and we decided that the, the Gaming Commission really needed additional time in order to be prepared for all of us to act, the commissioners to act uh, on this in a, an informed fashion. So that will be addressed at a future meeting. So with that, we'll get started with the minutes. Commissioner O'Brien. Certainly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have meaning minutes from February 11th, 2021 in the packet today. I would move that the commission approve the minutes from February 11th, 2021, subject to correction for typographical error or any other non-material matter. Do everyone second. have an oh, second. Did everyone have the opportunity to review? Okay. Any edits, comments? Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you, Tanya. Four zero. Moving on then to the administrative update. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, before we get into item 3A, I would just like to acknowledge uh, Teresa Fiore. She has uh, received a very uh, exciting opportunity and she's going to be leaving us. So I just wanted to publicly thank her for all the work that she has done. She's been such an instrumental part of this team and of the uh, Research and Responsible Gaming Division. So I wanted to turn it over to Mark just to say a few words in recognition of Teresa and all that she's done for the Gaming Commission. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, good morning. 
Madam Chair and Commissioners. So last meeting, I was really happy to announce um, a new addition to our team, and it makes me really sad, actually, to um, make this announcement. Um, uh, Teresa, um, Teresa has been with the commission for almost five years. Uh, it was a new position um, in what was still a relatively new commission, and um, she started just after we launched Play My Way at Plain Ridge Park Casino. She started before the opening of MGM. Um, or Encore, and over the past five years has been um, pretty darn instrumental in the success of, of um, our, our responsible gaming efforts at, at the Gaming Commission, um, overseeing a lot of the daily operations of the GameSense uh, program, um, the Voluntary Self-Exclusion program. Um, Teresa has been the, the daily contact for that. Um, in each of these areas, she's just been a, a fantastic uh, partner um, in rolling these programs out and seeing the vision of, of where they can go in the future. So, Teresa, I totally wish you the, the very best of luck. Um, and I hope that um, in your new position, you're, you're taking away um, some of the, the lessons that you've learned um, both hard and easy lessons here uh, from the Gaming Commission. So all the best to you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate the send off as well. Um, always a little strange because it's virtual, but happy to see everyone. Um, and I just appreciate the opportunity um, to have worked on such innovative, um, you know, projects, especially in my home state um, with the legalization of casino gambling, it completely changed. Um, so I appreciate everyone's um, patience at times with me um, and explaining different things. And it's been a pleasure working with everyone. Thanks so much, Teresa. I don't know if any of the, the commissioners want to chime in. I'll give you a chance, but um, I just I just want to thank you. You've been a, you're a really wonderful addition to this team. We're all going to miss you very much, but especially Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me let me oh, go ahead, commissioners in the guy. Sorry, I wanted to jump in as well. Um, yeah, we're going to miss you, Teresa. Uh, best of luck. Uh, I think um, we know we, many people know that you did great work for us and. It's, I believe, because of that, that you have um, uh, in part going to this opportunity that will make you remain in responsible gaming and in the industry. So um, I think maybe our paths will cross uh, in the near future, hopefully. Uh, and if not, we really uh, um, look forward for you to stay in touch and wish you the best. Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner Brian. Yes, uh, Teresa, I'll miss you outside my office when we get back to work and getting to know you a little bit, getting to hear about your family. And, uh, but again, excellent work. It was apparent to all of us. Um, you jumped right in, you learned the issues, you made, uh, you built relationships, which I'm sure is part of why you're getting another opportunity. But um, the work is, uh, speaks for itself uh, with regard to what we've done in this area. And um, I'm always happy for folks who, you know, a new opportunity, right? It's so important. And if we had a little part in that, letting you grow your career, then um, good for us. But uh, we will miss you. Sure, Brian. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, good luck, Teresa. We will miss you, as everyone has said. Um, I think it does speak to the work that the commission has done, that you and Mark have done, too, that you had the opportunity. It sounds like a great opportunity for you. Um, so I wish you luck in that. And um, I, I think the only good thing is that Marie Claire did start uh, before that the notice actually came in because I don't want more <laughs> than otherwise. Uh, but hopefully we do cross paths and I wish you luck in the new position. Excellent. Therese, Therese I just want to congratulate you on your, your next opportunity. As everyone said, I think it really speaks to uh, the important uh, contribution you've made with respect to responsible gaming um, as, as we emerged in the casino market and the leadership you've taken, I've been so impressed by uh, the level of professionalism that you offer, uh, not only our team internally, but I've seen you interacting with so many external stakeholders, really conveying to them the, uh, the uh, uh, import of responsible gaming as we um, 
intersect with the gambling industry. It's real, really nice to see that you're going to continue contributing your expertise to this important area, as Commissioner Zunica right away mentioned. I'm having um, a little bit of a flashback right now as I sit in my home, still working virtually, and you're right, I wish we were doing this personally. Teresa will be embarrassed, but I'm going to, I'm going to mention it in any case. I was so fortunate to join the Gaming Commission and have as really um, my, my closest neighbor, Teresa, and um, across the hall from me because uh, I watched Teresa grow up and I'm looking out right now in the, my backyard where she proudly donned her prom dress with her very nice prom date um, and several, maybe 15 other couples um, at the time. And so uh, her picture is prominently in our house <laughs> at, along with all the prom, prom date um, pictures. So to see the professional that you've become in such an important area uh, makes me proud as, as a former neighbor and uh, um, a, a mother of your, your peers, but most of all in my professional capacity, it's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you as well, I really appreciate that. And I have the same pictures. <laughs> it was a gorgeous day. <laughs> all right, so, um, so, to Commissioner Cameron's point, if we had a little bit of a, a part in, in this great mark, this only means that um, whatever is next in terms of your division, uh, Teresa has paved a great road for you. And, uh, and now um, the only thing is that Marie, Claire, and Teresa won't have the opportunity to, to work together. And I could already sense that that would have been a nice partnership. But um, I'm sure your roads, it's... Uh, uh, Commissioner Zuniga su suggested will um, our roads will intersect. So thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks so much, Teresa. Um, all right. So the next item on the agenda, the administrative update, I'm going to turn it over to Loretta and to Bruce to get started on the on-site casino updates. I'll start with Loretta. Thanks, Karen. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, and I know, Chair, you uh, mentioned the meeting next Wednesday. I know there's uh, some forward-looking attention given the announcements by the CDC and, and the Governor. Uh, but for purposes of this morning, I have been reporting on operations along with uh, Bruce and activity at the three properties at the public meetings. And really for this two-week interview, uh, interval, there is not that much that's particularly newsworthy. Uh, the three licensees through their employees have continued to follow and monitor and enforce uh, the health and safety measures put into place by the commission for the gaming areas and have continued to follow the measures put into place by the governor for the amenities at each property. Uh, you know, the patrons overall have continued to accept and abide by uh, the measures as well. Um, it is interesting to reflect on the past uh, 14 months and the past approximately 11 months uh, since the reopening uh, after the uh, COVID closure and uh, reflect on the coordination that took place to first close those premises that were never meant to be shuttered and then uh, reopening in July subject to strict uh, conditions. Uh, you know, there have been uh, many uh, measures and steps along the way. Uh, you know, October of last year, uh, uh, Roulette was authorized to resume in a very unique and uh, innovative way to keep people safe. Uh, in November, there was uh, another adaptation that needed to be made uh, for an early closure. Uh, under an order of the governor uh, tracking a surge in cases at that time, limiting hours of operation, and there was a stay-at-home advisory, um, uh, aligning with the metrics. Again, there was then a return to 24 uh, operations. And as public health metrics continue to improve, a commission authorized the reintroduction of craps and additional seat at uh, blackjack-style uh, tables. Over that time and through all of those permutations, the three properties have consistently dedicated substantial staff and substantial resources to the effort. 
Uh, that holds true at the parent company level of each company, and it holds true at the property level uh, uh, as, as well. They have shown a great deal of adaptability, responsiveness, responsibility, uh, given uh, this unprecedented situation, which is you know, outside uh, their core business. Uh, so for each of these updates that the IEB has been doing at the Commission's public meetings over these months, there is ongoing daily behind the scenes work, constant communication between each property and the IEB. And I can say from my perspective that every phone call, every question, every issue that has ever been brought forward to them has been met with um, immediate response, real problem solving attitude. I also wanted to note, and I know that you as a commission uh, uh, often note that while many of us have been working at home over these months by necessity, the casinos employees, members of our gaming agents unit, state police gaming enforcement unit have been on site. So I did want to bring a particular attention to those employees at the commission and the casinos that have been part of those teams on a day-to-day uh, -day basis. Um, just a word about vaccines now. You're aware of the vaccine site at, Con uh, at Encore with a, a convenient uh, way to allow citizens as well as Encore employees uh, to become uh, fully vaccinated. Uh, both Encore and MGM have implemented incentive program for their employees to encourage vaccination. Um, and that is underway, has been underway uh, for uh, a couple weeks, I believe. Uh, Plain, uh, Plain Ridge is taking a little different approach with uh, incentivizing uh, patrons who demonstrate uh, vaccination, but they as well are in close touch with their employees uh, about their health status and encouraging um, full vaccination uh, as well. So I, I guess this is a long way of saying these past two weeks have continued to go well uh, at each property. I did think it was appropriate uh, at this time to uh, reflect on the past uh, 14 months a little bit. I, I hope I got the timeline uh, right. Um, uh, you know, those are my comments. Happy to answer any questions. I know Assistant Director Band is here and uh, always offers uh, something uh, interesting through, through his lens. Uh, the occupancy levels have just been fine. They've been in compliance. Uh, the only thing I had to add with uh, uh, Director Lilio's kind of stole my thunder is MGM oh, sorry, started, sorry. It had started uh, uh, Show Us Your Vax program for their employees. It's an incentive program where you can win uh, cash prizes and stays at the hotel and, and so on. Uh, and all you have to do is show your vaccination card to the HR program which is a, a, a company-wide program that they're doing. Uh, I agree with uh, Director Olios that uh, the casinos over the last 14 months have been nothing but cooperative with this program. Uh, they've done everything we, we've asked pretty much and, and you know, have certainly reached out uh, when they, they've had any questions at all uh, to get it clarified. Uh, they've been great. I would like to add one other thing and thank Teresa for uh, all the time here. Our, our uh, gaming agents have worked very closely with her and uh, she'll really be, be missed by our group. Uh, she's always been a pleasure to work with uh, from our standpoint. So we'll miss you, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Thank you, Bruce. You're welcome. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Well, I want to just thank um, both of you for the, the the recap, particularly Loretta, going through that timeline because it does reflect um, not only the the uh, good work and the responsiveness of our three licensees, but really the good work of, of Karen, your entire team, Loretta, your entire team, Bruce, your teams, um, in, in in being able to uh, to respond to all the the changes that occurred, all the various orders that occurred, and to do it in a way that achieved the goal. Back in July, when there was a reopening, we hoped it would be a sustained reopening. And 
And we were able to achieve that because of everyone's vigilance on this team and the license fees and also the publics, you know, the, the patrons um, who attended. So uh, that's, that's good for all employees. That's good for the Commonwealth. It's good for business. And now we'll see um, what the future brings, but thank you. I, I um, at some point, uh, I'm imagining a graphic that would really outline that timeline, uh, Loretta, um, <clears throat> for some memorializing it in some way. I think, Bruce, you would say, in your career, you never thought you'd be shutting down casinos. So. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I have shut down casinos before in my career. <laughs> but not for the good <laughs> reason. Yeah, that's <laughs> correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any comments, uh, commissioners? All set? All right. And Kathy, we may want to also just, just get a quick update from Alex just on the racing side. Um, you know, oh, I'm, yes, I'm so, yes, I'm so sorry. I wasn't going to move on yet anyway, but yes. Good morning, Dr. Lightbound. Good morning. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to uh, echo what Director Lilio said on the uh, racing and simulcasting side. Um, as you know, Plain Ridge has started live racing again, and we're getting great uh, general compliance with our protocols. Um, the big question is, um, when can we change them? So um, uh, the commission is going to be addressing that next week. Um, the, uh, everyone was very good over the past year about um, responding very quickly to the different things that came up. Um, a lot of our meetings were um, came up quickly, depending on how things had changed due to the COVID. And um, so the um, licensees and the horsemen all had to be very nimble about getting um, plans to us and working through different issues to uh, make sure we were all safe. And, um, I, I do um, want to thank them all again um, for their cooperation and for um, helping it be a sustained opening. Um, and we're just in such a much better spot right now. It really is uh, wonderful to be at this position now. And Dr. Lycon, you were really ahead of everyone. You know, it started early in, in April of 20, was it April or May 2020? Uh, we didn't start, we couldn't start till July with- Oh yeah, um, you couldn't start to July. Yeah, okay. with everything else. So we were, we had to delay our opening in April until July. Um, but we did, um, we were, uh, our staff and all were some of the first people that were um, actually like back in the office, so to speak. That's and, what it was, yeah. Um, and again, um, thank you to, to everyone in the in racing because um, they did go back to in-person um, work last summer and worked through the um, pandemic um, with the horsemen and with the licensees on, on the ground. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with my memory because I have this image of being down there and it was, but can you remind me of the, PPCs, I don't know if anybody has it off the top of their head, PPCs reopening date back in July in versus horse racing. Weren't you before the casino? I think, um, I think we might have started qualifiers around the 6th or so, and then maybe started racing on around the 13th, some, somewhere around in there. Yeah, so the, it was the qualifying races that were ahead. Now I'm remembering. Yes. Thank you. Again, a, a timeline would be really helpful if we can memorialize it in our free time. And by the way, when we acknowledge all the work that was done uh, during that period, you're doing your non-COVID-19 responsibilities at the same time, and that's not lost on us. No one missed a beat. There were, um, you know, in racing, obviously, there are a lot of um, regulations and protocols, um, very, you know, strict protocols and all that we adhere to. And so it definitely was um, challenging adding the uh, COVID protocols on top of that, but everybody rose to the occasion. Yeah, and I see uh, Steve O'Toole just took a glimpse in and, and we uh, commend the partnership that the two of you shared at that time. So thank you. Any questions for either Loretta, Dr. Lightbound, or Bruce, commissioners? All set. Okay, we've got a good full agenda ahead. Karen, is there anything else? No, we're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on then to item number four. Chief Skinner, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners and everyone. Um, so today I have three positions for you to consider.
consider exempting from the service employee registration requirements. <clears throat> Excuse me. Therefore, the Wahlburgers restaurant out at MGM Springfield, and you have the full job description for each position in your packet. But just to summarize, uh, we have the fry cook um, who is responsible for preparing starters and sides for meals and is the last touch before the meal is delivered to patrons. We have the expediter position. Uh, that's the middleman between the front and back of the house, the kitchen. Um, the position has the responsibility of ensuring the meal conforms to patron specifications. Uh, and then the board and window is the third position. Uh, it's responsible for building burgers and sandwiches at the back of the house before passing on to the fry cook for delivery to patrons. As you know, Wahlburgers is located in a standalone building on MGM property, so there's no concern about access to secure gaming areas or any gaming related confidential or secure information. Uh, neither of these positions has any managerial or supervisory responsibility, uh, nor uh, are they responsible for storing, distributing, selling, or serving alcoholic beverages? So for those reasons, I fully support exempting these positions from the service employee registration requirements and recommend your vote to approve. And of course, happy to answer any questions you have. Oh, you're, you're muted. Sorry, my landline was ringing. Um, any questions for Leticia? Okay, I think that she's asked for a vote. Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'll move uh, that the commission exempt the fry cook, expediter, and board and window positions at Wahlburgers at MGM Springfield from the registration requirements in accordance with 205 CMR 134031B for the reasons discussed today and uh, as described in the commissioner's pack. I second that. Questions, comments? Okay, commissioner, well done again, uh, uh, Nikisha, very, very thorough in exemplifying really the purpose of, of this option for us. Uh, commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. I vote yes, four zero, thank you. Thank you. And, and that concludes all of your business today, correct, Chief Skinner? That's correct, Chair. Okay, thank you so much. All right, and then now moving on to item number five. Um, Dr. Lightbound, you have several items for us today. We'll get started. The first topic I wanted to talk to you about is our drug testing program. And uh, right from the beginning of it, we start um, with um, using a request for proposals for our lab that was developed by the um, Racing Medication Testing Consortium. So uh, the regulatory industry re realized that it's not only important that you hire a lab that has different certifications, but that in your um, request for response for um, to hire a lab that you have certain things in there to make sure that um, they're going to meet all of the requirements. So right from the beginning, um, the we start on the racing division with that so that it's important that um, the responses we get are in compliance with everyone. So we use that um, and then uh, the lab that we uh, did contract with starting in uh, 2015, um, does have the racing medication and testing consortium accreditation and also the um, ISO 17025 accreditation, which is what um, the um, industry recognizes as the lab needing right now. Uh, the lab director, which um, I think most of you have had, um, have met her in different uh, hearings. Um, she's uh, has great experience in the horse racing industry. She's on numerous different um, boards and um, has been wonderful to work with. Um, di different things come into effect. Um, one of the things is uh, RCI, the Racing Commissioners International, um, has a uniform classification of drug substances, um, realizing that um, not every drug uh, is necessarily um, as what you call quote, 
um, bad as others. So it goes all the way from class one, which are drugs that should never be found in a racehorse, down to um, a class five, which may be a, uh, like a therapeutic drug. And this is one of the um, challenges that I think racing has had is trying to explain to the general public the difference between a, um, when the general public hears a drug positive, that's all they hear. They don't necessarily understand that maybe it's an overage of what is a therapeutic medication and it's just not something that you want at a certain level in the horse on a race day um, compared to some drug that is um, what you would consider performance enhancing that should never be in a horse. So that's one thing we try to um, distinguish for the general public. Um, the um, Racing Commissioners International, uh, with help from the Racing Medication and Testing Consortium, also came up with a controlled th therapeutic medication schedule. This, this has been in effect for quite a while. And this realizes or recognizes that a private veterinarian working on a horse, much like your private veterinarian working on your dog or cat, needs to be able to use certain drugs to help an animal that may be sick or injured. Um, and, that, and that's totally appropriate. We, we want to have these um, animals treated and we want them to get better. Um, so they came up, uh, worked with private veterinarians and regulatory veterinarians to come up with drugs that are commonly used in practice um, and try to come up with guidelines for the veterinarians on um, when they could use them and for how long and what amounts. Um, and that really has given some guidance to them instead of just kind of blindly saying, well, I'm going to treat your horse, but I don't know um, how long it would have to stay out of racing before it could race and, and be clear of this drug. So that's been an important um, tool that has come along. Um, there's also uniform drug testing lab standards, once again, to try to make it uniform throughout the um, country um, on what the labs test for and um, how they go ahead, uh, how they go about this. Uh, we also um, use the protocols uh, for um, the test barn that have been developed through these two agencies and um, the protocols for split sample testing. So these all are, are um, standardized um, policies that uh, best and basically best practices. And um, they've been very helpful for us on training our employees. And um, it's really helped with um, if a drug positive or a drug overage does come up. Um, we have standard procedures that we follow. Um, it affords the horsemen um, their due process. They have a right to a split sample. Um, and if an, uh, a, one of our um, drug adverse findings gets appealed, I think it's really helped our legal team um, to be able to um, show what our procedures are and um, how we go about maintaining chain of evidence and all of those. Um, there's um, been a lot of interest um, recently after the um, finding in the Derby. Um, it so happens that our lab, Industrial Laboratories, is also the laboratory that um, conducted the testing for Kentucky. Um, I don't have any um, personal knowledge on this case, so I don't want to imply that at all. Um, we have had eight um, overages for betamethasone, that particular drug that was found over the last eight years here. Um, I went back on a few of them to find the levels and they were at 21, 25, and 26 picograms per mil. Um, it was reported that um, in the press that the Derby um, overage was 21 picograms. So it's in, the, in that ballpark. Um, you can't necessarily um, draw any conclusions from um, a simple number as to um, how and when the a particular drug was administered. Um, a small drug, a small amount of a drug given very close to the race may give you the same amount as a large amount given further away from the race. Um, so um, I, I just want to state that too. Um, so I think with all these um, procedures that we've put in place, it's um, really helped um, our agency, it's helped our employees, and um, the, um, it, I think it's also helped the uh, horsemen to maintain their rights. Um, are there any questions?
Uh, I think Commissioner Cameron will have some comments and questions. I do, and I just wanted to add, um, Dr. Leifbaum did an excellent job of really explaining the evolution with this commission and, and the steps we've taken. One of the things she's probably too modest to tell us is that um, is that RCI Racing Commissioners International actually um, has a has a um, you know kind of best practices and they list agencies and we are you know one of a handful of agencies in the country that are listed as the absolute top score for a model agency. Um, they. They judge about five different uh, categories, and we are right at the top and, and listed as uh, you know, a model agencies for the way we regulate, and in particular with our standards around um, medication testing. So that is a tribute to uh, Dr. Leifbaum and her team, um, uh, as well as the legal division does an excellent job also of of preparing cases and making sure that due process is there for everyone, split samples, whatnot. So um, just a great effort and we have been recognized uh, internationally for, as a model agency for the way we do business. So thanks to everyone. It's, it's, uh, it's nice to see when you read, uh, you know, something from RCI and there we are right at the top. So good, good work. And, and um, Alex, very clear, thank you. Uh, and, and also thank you for putting in to light some of the news stories that we were reading that prompted our request for you to, to report today on this. Commissioner Zuniga, I know you also wanted to hear this report. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, um, you know, I, I was, uh, I echo the comments of Commissioner Cameron. Uh, uh, Alex, if I could um, just from your memo, um, you uh, you put a good in good context the horse racing integrity and safety authority uh, that was signed into law in, in, in at the end in December of 2020, um, uh, which apparently codified a lot of the practices that had been recommended and we had implemented, um, uh, you know, from our from RCI that we had implemented that you described. Um, are there any practices recommended there? For horse for thoroughbred racing, uh, or any elements in terms of control and protocols that we have not yet implemented that we should look at, or is it fair to say that by virtue of following RCI guidelines from from the past, we are um, uh, up to speed in this notion of the the act that was signed at the end of 2020. I think uh, Alex is going to talk more in detail on the next item on the act, oh. but uh, on that answer, do you want to, in terms of uh, the narrow question that the commissioner asked? Yeah, so um, on the narrow question, right now the Horse Racing and, and Integrity Authority um, hasn't uh, written any, uh, you know, they haven't pro promulgated any rules or regulations yet. They're very much at the very beginning stage, and um, I think it helps to kind of compare it to when the Gaming Commission first started up. Um, this is going to be a new authority. Um, they just recently announced their board of directors, and they um, named um, members to, they have two standing committees, one about medication and drug control, and one about track safety. So. Um, they have a, a long way to go <laughs> and um, there aren't very many, well, there's really virtually no specifics at this point. So um, that being said, a lot of what is written in the um, statute um, mimics things that the um, National Thoroughbred Track Association, NTRA, what they have done as far as track safety goes. Um, if you remember, if you recall Suffolk, had that accreditation when they were racing live and had had it for, for years. Um, and um, that was, uh, you know, quite an extensive um, program that they still have in effect today for, for other tracks um, to certify them on safety issues. Um, as well as a lot of what is written in the statute is things that um, the Racing Commissioners International and um, the RMTC have um, put into effect. The big difference is that RCI doesn't have the authority to mandate um, the model rules and the different practices, and, and um, neither do any of the, of the other two agencies. 
So it really comes down to um, the states um, doing it. And about 92% of tracks now are in compliance with um, these different um, things, but um, they aren't all. So on a national level, um, there had been an effort to standardize everything. Um, and there were different ways that they could have gone about it. Um, one would have been to make um, like a interstate compact with the different jurisdictions and have RCI kind of have that authority. Um, but when um, over the years, because uh, there's been federal legislation out there for six or seven years in different forms. Um, and this is what eventually passed. So now with the um, Horse Racing Integrity Act, the um, it's mandatory for thoroughbred racing in the entire country and it'll go effect um, July 1st of 2020. Um, for other breeds such as the standard bred racing, the harness racing, it is a uh, opt in. So, um, you know, this is something, um, again, there's not enough known right now to start making decisions, but this is something that um, we definitely want to keep on our radar. And I know the harness tracks and the harness horsemen are, are well aware of this and have been also um, following this. Thank you. Any other uh, questions, at least with respect to the testing, and then if you want to kind of re reset for the second item on the agenda, um, Alex. Uh, yes. On the testing, uh, I just want to make sure, Commissioner O'Brien, did you have any questions on the testing? You and I um, weren't here in 2015, but we both are well aware of the, the great progress that the Commission made um, under Dr. Lightbound and its leadership. No, no, I don't. I know that uh, Enrique had asked the question about sort of our history in terms of the recent events in the news. So that was um, interesting to hear. But uh, no, I've, I've, I've heard about the great job we've done in the past. Um, I think you're right. Dr. Lightbound won't crow about it. So Commissioner Cameron does it on her behalf. Um, I think rightfully so. Um, so I don't have any Thank questions. You. Okay, then uh, an update on the uh, the uh, the national level on the act, if you want to, you've given us some background, but I want to make sure you get all of your talking points in. Okay. So um, the act did pass and was signed into law in December of last year. It was part of the omnibus um, bill. So it's uh, that legislation was like 5,000 pages long. Um, so I didn't include <laughs> that in our packet, <laughs> uh, but it, it's very easy to Google it if anybody um, wants to see it. Um, it's not without, I will say it's not without controversy. Um, and there are um, a couple of lawsuits now already um, against it. And so we'll just have to see how those um, play out. Um, the um, act covers uh, drug testing, medication control, and um, racetrack safety. Um, and um, like I said, a lot of the things they cover are actually things that are being um, done already. Um, some of the, um, it, it's, the way it's set up is there's the, um, a private run authority um, and it will be under the Federal Trade Commission and the authority will come up with the regulations and then it'll be up to the Federal Trade Commission to approve those regulations. That's the way it's been set up. Um, the Federal Trade Agency can either um, reject, modify, or approve um, whatever regulations the authority comes up with. Um, I guess there's um, a similar situation in um, the financial industry, where there's a financial industry regulatory authority that's private um, that um, proposes rules to the Security and Exchange Commission. Um, but that's one of the... Um, and I won't get into the legal um, aspects of it. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but um, you know, I, I've let Todd know about um, this um, this agency coming along. Um, one of the questions is about along the lines of state rights and and that um, the deadline um, for imp full implementation, according to statute, is July 1st of 2022. Um, mandatory for thoroughbreds, opt-in for um, other breeds of uh, racehorses. Um, they'll be responsible for developing and implementing um, 
horse racing um, uh, doping and medication control program and a safety program. Um, like I said, they just set up um, committee members for those two um, committees. And so they're just um, really in the beginning stages. <clears throat> Um, in the statute, um, it has them contracting with um, the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, USADA, which is the agency that oversees Olympic uh, testing for humans. Um, let's see. Some of the other highlights. Um, one of the um, things that is going to be interesting and um, would come you know, before the commission is um, how it will be funded. Um, right now, we, we um, pay for our drug testing um, protocols and our um, people who were involved in that system through what we get from the handle from the um, racetracks and our um, license fees, things like that. Um, the authority will um, come up with a amount based on what they think their budget will be and then using the number of um, starts of ra racing horses in a particular state and give each state um, basically an idea of what their cost would be. So then it would be um, if the commission um, decided to opt in, then the question would be um, then do we just take the money that say we're paying our laboratory now, does it just get paid to the authority instead? Um, the, in this statute, there's also a, uh, the state can decline to um, pay for it out of those funds. Um, and it could be charged on a per start basis back to um, the licensees, um, meaning the tracks and or the horsemen. Um, there wouldn't be a double billing, so um, there would, if we were not um, paying th through the handle, you know, they, we probably would, there might be a mechanism where we didn't take that money from the handle anymore. Um, uh, so there's a lot to figure out on this. Um, and of course, uh, I've already told the Horsemen's Association, this is something that, um, will involve um, open commission meetings um, and we'll get the input of the horsemen's groups. Um, right now it's really too, pre you know, it's premature. We don't know what their regulations are going to be. Um, we don't know how much it's going to cost. Um, so where we only have standard bread racing now, um, we aren't in quite the time crunch that maybe some of the um, jurisdictions that have thoroughbred racing are in. You know, they're going to have to be ready to go um, next next summer. Um, on the harness side, we um, have some time to wait and see um, and uh, see what the um, exactly how the cost is going to be um, shared. There is definitely concern that it could be an expensive. Um, program. Um, and again, a lot of what is in the statute are things that we're already um, doing through RCI and through RMTC. And, um, you know, we even, um, the commission several years ago started having Plain Ridge have an independent person come in and review the track um, before they open. So in a lot of ways, we're, um, we may even be a little bit ahead on, on some of these issues. Um, There are some things in the statute um, that the new authority can enter um, into agreements with commissions on. So um, perhaps they um, enter into an agreement that we provide the testing personnel. Um, because that was a question too, was this national organization going to bring in their you know, own veterinarians, their own testing assistants and all that. Um, so there has been, uh, there was something put in there that um, the authority can contract with individual commissions on certain um, things that um, they may want done on a local level. Um, let's see. 
And, uh, you know, it does get a little more specific about um, 90 days before um, the effective date of the um, uh, program going into effect. They'll provide the states with what their um, cost sharing would be and that type of thing. Um, it, it is a, um, on the standard bred side where the standard bred horses race fairly frequently and they can get a large number of starts in a year. Um, a per start fee um, is, is um, you know, could be an issue. Um, and um, also if uh, figuring out how a uh, jurisdiction that um, doesn't have as much, uh, give out as much purse money as another one, um, that may come into effect as well. Um, there's also some concern on um, what the penalty structures will be. Um, right now, there's some um, leeway for mitigating circumstances and all with the RCI. Um, and we'll have to see how rigid um, the penalties might be under this new authority. So for instance, a um, $1,000 fine for a um, trainer at Plain Ridge is very significant. Um, and it might not um, be as significant for um, somebody that's racing horses at uh, Belmont Park and earning a much larger purses. So that's something that we'll have to um, look at too. So um, again, um, I think the bill itself is um, 60 pages long and the bill doesn't even start to really on reg get into regulations. So um, this is a very brief uh, recap and I might've missed a, a few points, but I think those are the main points. Um, you know, main thing is uh, they want to try to get um, uniform guidance throughout the country. Um, and the other um, main point I have is that right now there's um, very little known. Um, so for anybody to set, to ask me, you know, is the commission going to implement this or go with this new thing on the standard bread side? It's, it's way too early to um, have any type of recommendation. Um, and again, um, on most of these issues, I think we're already at or exceeding what the authority um, may come up with. And um, I look forward to um, keeping the commission um, updated as this moves along and look forward to um, working with the Harness Horsemen's Association and um, Plain Ridge on um, any um, concerns they may have on this. and. <clears throat> um, any suggestions they may have as well. Commissioners, Commissioner Cameron. Just one question, um, Dr. Leipov, any rationale provided about why the thoroughbred are mandated and other breeds are opt-in? It um, started to, it was mainly pushed originally by um, thoroughbred um, interests. And um, there has been um, some concern among the different breeds about um, should they be um, treated in a uniform way or should there be certain um, things that are, uh, make sense for one breed that may not make sense for another. So um, I think in that vein, um, they went with, uh, you know, we'll make it mandatory on the thoroughbred racing side and then, um, make it opt-in for standard breads. And um, depending on how they um, gear up that side of the program, um, you know, it may eventually, um, maybe standard breads will want it to be mandatory, but for now it is separate. Thank you. Other questions for Alex? Commissioner Zinnigan, I'll set. You, know, you were right that I did ask my question ahead of the agenda item. So um, thank you for the summary. And, and, uh, oh, you're we'll, you're we'll stay posted. You did your reading well. <laughs> uh, you're well, anticipating I, well. So I, I figured after the first remarks that she hadn't touched on on, on yeah. something, but she obviously had planned to it later. But uh, so yeah, thank you we, for the summary. She, yeah, she separated it out nicely. Um, um, that was fine. I, I guess my big takeaway is that I think you're messaging well that, that this is underway 
it would be premature for you to bring anything to the commissioner to the associations, but that it will be a, a matter that this commission, and rather than each state government, um, that's the regulating um, agency that will have jurisdiction as to um, the implementation, and that will have some degree, some at least 90 days, is that what I'm hearing, to um, for implementation once they solidify their rules and regulations, is that? correct yeah it's not they give you um, 90 days um, notice on how much it would cost your individual okay. jurisdiction okay. so um, they I'm not sure how fast they'll um, go on on their rulemaking um, a lot of the people on the different committees uh, have been involved in horse racing and have been on um, you know associated with the different the alphabet soup uh, <laughs> agencies um, dealing with it so um, that maybe the rule making process will go quickly I'm not I'm not sure how fast but I think the rule making process will come out first and then um, you know figuring out the um, cost and uh, how to spread that cost out will come up after that but it sounds like we'll have sufficient time to do thoughtful process get public comments you know, have public hearings, all the necessary pro uh, process that um, we like to engage in to ensure informed decision making. But we're yes. far from that right now. And and one of the decisions may be um, not to opt in um, the first year, or you know, and see how it, it works on the thoroughbred side. Um, and also, it'll be interesting to see. Um, there's uh, multiple jurisdictions that have both standard bread and thoroughbred racing. So it'll be interesting to see what those jurisdictions decide to do because they will be doing it on the thoroughbred side. And then whether they opt in on the standard bread side and how that um, works out and develops will be interesting to see also. Well, then we look forward to continuing updates, but it sounds as though we have a, uh, an update now and a plan for the future. Great. Very, very helpful. I know Commissioner Cameron, you were probably uh, well informed on this, so uh, but I think the others, the rest of us are a little bit caught up now, so thank you. All right, do you wanna to go to item uh, C now, uh, Dr. Yes. Leifel? Um, today um, we have um, Chip Campbell, the president of the Standard Bread Owners of Massachusetts here for um, their uh, recognition as the breeders representative group. Um, just before I introduce him, I want to mention that um, the program continues to thrive. Um, even through the pandemic last year, we were able to have a great series of sire stakes races. Um, each year, they continue to get more competitive. And um, the organization is always um, very easy to work with, and um, the program went off very smoothly last year. Um, so now I'll introduce uh, Chip Campbell. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lightbaum. I think uh, Nancy Longobardi, the Secretary Treasurer, is also with us today on the, on the call if, if we have any questions that I may not be able to answer. Um, Good morning. I am on, yes. Thank oh. you, Chip. Terrific. Can hear you. Great. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Good, <clears throat> good morning, Commissioners, and uh, thank you for the time today. Uh, as uh, Dr. Lightbaum said, we're here today to request the approval uh, to be approved, to be recognized as the organization to administer the standard bread breeding and sire steak program. Uh, even with all the challenges of uh, 2020, the program was able to hold its own and ended the year on, on solid ground. We, we do have a, a few slides. I don't, I can just go forward if, if they're not available, but the the points there, it shows the, the number of registered broodmares um, uh, went from 122 in 2019 to 120 in 2020. And, it, and if you, if you uh, think for a minute that if you're a breeder, um, you have to make that decision to breed between February of the calendar year and the final breeding is in July. And the other decision you have to make is you have to choose to have your broodmare here in Massachusetts 
on the ground at a farm by December 1st. Uh, that time frame on both of those decisions uh, was certainly uh, during a time of, of continued uncertainty. And uh, we would not have been surprised if the number of broodmares had, had been reduced more because the, um, those two decisions during a time when there were many other things going on, um, I think speaks to the, the uh, continued confidence in the program that, that many breeders have. Uh, on the farms, the number of farms basically stayed about the same. Uh, the demands for their services uh, continue to, to uh, be level or, or increase. And, and one of the reasons they increased on some of the farms is because UMass Amherst, uh, unfortunately, was, uh, had to shut down to the public. Um, so we didn't have that, that resource to both house and full out and get your mares uh, bred back, um, which, which was quite a resource for, for many of us to, to lose. And, and we're, very, we're very hopeful, we're optimistic that that, that will change here shortly and that they'll be a, um, uh, back on board and, and participating in the, in the near future. Uh, the, the number of races, Sire steak races stayed, stayed the same, um, which we're very happy about that. And the, um, but there were, there were more opportunities uh, given to, to mass breads. Um, specifically, the, the uh, race secretary is writing races now that give preference to mass bred horses. And they also give preference to 100% mass owned horses. Those two uh, opportunities um, now allow for more horses to be involved locally and we find that that the feedback on that has been very positive and, and con should continue to be um, positive going in the future because it it allows for these mass spreads after their sire stake season is over at two and at three to be able to continue to race locally with a preference um, being the mass breads. And so I, it, it increases the value of the horse. Uh, and it also uh, increases the, um, the most likely to, to have people stay around and, and race at Plain Ridge instead of maybe selling their horse, which would end up in Ohio or Indiana or, or, or somewhere else uh, racing uh, in, in overnights. Along those lines, Plain Ridge Park uh, ha has been a, a very valuable partner with the, the breeding program. Um, the, their willingness to, to basically accommodate us in, in any way they possibly can, and, and especially last year to allow races to go off um, pretty much uh, as planned, which, which is pretty exciting. Uh, specifically, uh, Steve O'Toole and his staff, uh, they, they go above and beyond. Long before the race dates are even chosen for the year, all the way through the year, and then implementing the, uh, the program. And, and I, I just feel it's important to, to point that out. We have a, a um, we feel a, a very good working relationship with, with them, a, as well as um, uh, Dr. Lightbaum. Who, who helps in, in many ways and, and assists in, in many different ways to have things go smoothly. If you can see the, the number of starters, if the slide is up, if they, they aren't, if it's not, then the, um, but the number of starters increased uh, in the sire stake races, as well as the, the talent level. Um, you, you can see that in the fact that out of eight restricted sire stake races, there were five new uh, track and stake or stake records. Um, that goes to the, the um, I guess the uh, more talented broodmares, bloodlines and people involved to continue to, to further the, um, the breed and give them an opportunity after sire stakes are over to be able to, to race. Um, 
although 2021 still has its challenges, uh, we remain optimistic about what is ahead of us all. And uh, thank you again for your time today. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kimball. We were able to follow along because we have um, the, the path that's in front of us. So we oh, did great. see the slides and the okay. public um, has them in the public packet. Of course, I'm mesmerized by the, the names of the, 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 the horses. <laughs> um, I don't know if we want to vote on our favorite, Commissioner Cameron. I'm, I'm kind of struck by Bag of Chips, uh, one of the Phillies names. <laughs> I, I agree that it's always interesting to read out to the track to see the names of the horses running is always yeah. uh, of great interest. It, it, yeah, that makes uh, makes it uh, uh, always fun. Um, <clears throat> questions for President Campbell. So the uh, starter number, just as a reminder to the public, went from 2019, it, it was 210, and then 2020, 239. So that does... That's a favorable increase, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a really a nice report. Um, and, and again, PPC will be presenting its quarterly report and will note uh, the compliment you've given them as, as a good partner. It doesn't surprise me. Uh, this is all very good news. I do know that you need um, a vote, Dr. Lightbound, today. But any questions for... Um, Mr. Campbell, I just before. one uh, comment, Madam Chair. I did, it wasn't a question, but I um, when I looked at the breeding numbers, I it, I did pause and I said, hmm, what? I did not realize that the pandemic um, really did impact. So those numbers are actually quite good, considering all of the elements that have to happen um, and the uncertainty that you just laid out. So I think that's a certainly a tribute to the dedication. Uh, of the uh, the folks involved, in particular the breeders. So thank you for educating us with that fact. Great. It, it remained stable, and in, in, in some points it was even more favorable, right, uh, Commissioner Cameron? Um, I guess I would love to hear, Dr. Lightbound, in the future, the update on the UMass um, uh, facility. Uh, I, I know that you've reported on that in the past, and, and I understand it's important importance in this program so we'll stay tuned um any further questions then we'll we'll need to provide a, a vote if we have a recommendation uh dr lightbound i recommend that they be approved as the uh, representative group of the standard bread breeders okay. commissioners Um, Madam Chair, I would move that the Commission approve the Standard Bread Owners of Massachusetts Incorporated as the representative organization of Standard Bread Breeders and Owners referenced in Chapter 128, Section 2J. Second. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. I vote yes, 4-0. Uh, President Campbell, thank you. And thank you, uh, Dr. Lightbound, for your ongoing work with, with this association and its success. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Nancy, thank you. Okay, then we're moving on to, I think it's, I'm scrolling back, uh, item D, uh, Dr. Lightbound, 5D. Yeah, so we thought it would be great to have a um, update on the um, meat. As you know, Plain Ridge uh, started racing um, mid-April, uh, and um, they continue to uh, work on trying to improve things for um, the horsemen and for uh, racing commission employees. Um, one of the things we noted last year when we had to um, quickly improvise because of the pandemic and move, um, space the horses out. So we use the entire um, backside basically as the paddock. Um, it made a lot of extra walking for everybody. Um, and um, <laughs> that, that put some stress on some people. Um, one solution that Plain Ridge came up with for this year was they put an extra door in the, uh, what was the old paddock. So that now if you're in the paddock or in the test barn, you can go directly through that door into the rest of the barn area. Uh, before you, it was not a big deal, but you had to either walk to the front or the back of the paddock to go around. Um, numerous people, both horsemen and um, our employees, have um, 
said how much uh, they appreciated that. So I just wanted to um, highlight one of the ways that um, Steve and his uh, crew has made things better for everybody um, this year even. Um, it was very uh, exciting to be able to open on time this year. I can't uh, stress that enough after uh, <clears throat> everything that we went through last year. Um, once again, I want to thank um, Steve and his crew and the horsemen for working through those issues last year. Uh, we got through a very difficult time um, in um, a, a good manner where um, everybody came out healthy and um, purse money was earned and um, jobs, people got back to their jobs, so it was very exciting. Um, this year, there is a, um, I feel, um, a real sense of optimism. Um, not just that it looks like the pandemic may be winding down, but everybody's very happy to be back racing. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Steve. <clears throat> Thanks, Alex. Um, I didn't realize that the uh, doors was going to be such a hit, so I think we'll probably add a few more. <laughs> Make everybody really happy, right? <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, commissioners, for uh, having me uh, present today. I'll give you a recap of uh, the last couple of years, and, uh, and as Alex said, where we're where we're headed in the future. Uh, I was really happy at the end of the year last year. I wasn't so happy during the year, but at the end of the year, I was very happy with uh, how the meet went off. Um, it was taxing for my staff, both on the top side as well as the back side. They did a tremendous job in uh, handling customers. Um, and we had one little glitch on the backside that was uh, taken care of with the help of the, uh, the horsemen. They, they self-policed uh, after, uh, after we ran into a little bit of a hiccup um, with some of the protocols. But they were very strict protocols. And uh, I give them a lot of credit. Uh, the Horsemen's Association stepped in and helped monitor as well as Alex's team and my team, and, and that helped out. And we had a, uh, I believe, a COVID-free uh, season, which is pretty uh, remarkable given the fact that when COVID first struck, as some of you might recall, uh, the harness racing industry in New Jersey and New York was hit pretty hard right out of the bat, right, right off the bat when no one really knew what was happening to people. So we're very proud of the fact that we pulled it off, and um, and and I give the credit, you know, to my staff uh, as well as uh, the work that went into um, pulling off a meet uh, shorthanded because of uh, some uh, some of the, some of my employees uh, didn't want to come back because they felt susceptible. So uh, we were very happy. Now <clears throat> getting to the getting to the numbers, uh, they're, they're pretty impressive as well. Uh, we had 68 days of racing in, in 2020 compared to 108 days in 2019. And of course, the horsemen will always tell you that they need more racing days. However, um, with those, with those uh, 68 days and the less racing, and given the fact that we went into the meet with $900,000 or into the uh, new year with $900,000 carried over in our purse account, and given the fact that we overpaid the purses by 500000 we were able to uh, uh, provide overnight purses of uh, $6,500,000, whereas for the 108 race days the year before, it was just a little bit over $9 million. So uh, they enjoy, uh, the horsemen enjoyed to, to the ability to race for pretty much the same amount, maybe even a little bit more, uh, during that time. So that, that provided them with uh, a stable income. And we also pulled off a very successful uh, Clara Barton and uh, Spirit of Massachusetts Day, which was right at the very beginning of when we opened. So that was a little bit uh, tough to do, but we, uh, we, we, got that, we got that in. And not only did we get that in, but we also got a world record from Manchego, uh, which we're very proud of. Uh, there's a picture of him in your packet. Uh, or her, I should say, it's it's a female horse. Uh, her uh, crossing the finish line in uh, in world record time, and, and when when I when I mention world record, that means it's a it's a record for a five eighths mile track for that particular uh, gate. Um, so that that that's standing today, and hopefully it'll stand for uh, for some time. 
Uh, as you just heard from Chip Campbell, and I won't steal any of his thunder, but <clears throat> the Massachusetts breeding program is, is just doing very, very well. Uh, we have uh, so many more horses. My race secretary has so many more horses now today that have been raised in the state to work with uh, in overnight races once their uh, racing in the sire stakes program is completed. So what that does for the track, what that does for the breeders themselves, and what that does for uh, the, the owners of those horses is tremendous. And one of the things, as Chip pointed out, uh, you know, the, the breeders have a, a long-term commitment. It's a three-year commitment, whether they even know that their horse is going to race. Uh, they start with a stallion book and breed a mare. It takes a year. And then you raise the foal. It's another year. And then you, there's big expenses in training. Some of them uh, go south to train and then come back. Uh, so it's three years of total commitment before any dollars are, are, are seen. So for, for the program to be th uh, striving the way it is, and, and we feel uh, at Plain with myself and my race secretary, Paul Barrett, feel that it's very important that we continue that on and give those horses, as Chip mentioned, recognition as far as conditions and also uh, so, uh, this uh, this year we plan on uh, actually writing some races for four and five year olds because their their stake races are limited to two and three year olds uh, so we want to we want to reward that commitment not only in our racing program but in the state of Massachusetts because there's so many farms and and we need these farms to continue on as well as training centers to continue on in order to provide our, our folks the, the tools they need to compete here uh, with the, and it's, and it's become highly competitive with, uh, with, all of our, uh, with all of our races and the purses that we're offering these days. Uh, as far as this year is concerned, we've been off to a great start. Um, uh, our track is in good shape. Um, Alex's team is doing, uh, is using the, do the new door that we put in. And, uh, and so are the horsemen. We've also added a few other uh, things uh, on the backside to make it a little bit uh, easier for our horsemen to, uh, to get around. It's still a little bit cumbersome. It's still a very large space to be operating out of and there's still some glitches. Uh, we're, working through, we're working through that, uh, but all, all things are very positive uh, for this coming season. That's about it, unless... Uh, Questions, commissioners, for Steve? Unless Alex wants to put in an order for more doors, uh, that's all. <laughs> to get them. We're good, thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Cameron. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, nice to see you. Great to see you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that report, and uh, I'm going to get, it just reminds me, I'm going to get out there soon, but I was just wondering how that infield is looking this year. Uh, the infield looks good. Um, we, have, uh, we, we have an awful lot of geese. We don't oh, like you do? Okay. Yeah. Our outrider, uh, he, he, uh, he, he tends to the geese uh, more than he tends to horses on the <laughs> okay. holding hot horses on the track. But uh, uh, the infield the infield's good. Um, I, I, think you, I think you know, but for the other commissioner's uh, uh, benefit, our infield was structured so that it takes all the storm water from the property and filters it through the infield for recycling. And we use that water for irrigation for the property, um, so all the nice green grass that we have coming, you know, coming into the property, and also the uh, uh, what the the hundreds of gallons of thousands of millions, I guess it is, gallons of water that we put on the track. I mean, in between every race, we put um, uh, at least twenty five hundred gallons of water down on, on the track between every race. So uh, we go through an awful lot of water. If we didn't have that recharge system, we I don't know where we would, our water bill would be very high, I guess. Um, but so our infield uh, sometimes looks a little uh, uh, tattered uh, on the very inside, but we try to keep the rim uh, as green and lush as possible. Yeah, it, it's a great, it's a great sustainability story, uh, Steve. Um, thank you uh, for the report as well, um, uh, Steve and. Um, even though this was a, an unusual year because of the, the delay start and, and whatnot due to COVID, uh, the numbers look increasingly improving. Um, as you mentioned, the, uh, um, the breeding program, 
Uh, are the uh, field sizes uh, increasing? Um, what do you expect for next year? Um, more flexibility, as you mentioned, for your your uh, your program to have uh, more options, or or what what do you see in terms of other benefits um, in terms of field size and whatnot? So we've realized the benefit of the program already um, with the field size. The field size has been large enough that we, that I, I believe most of, of them were all betting races last year, last year, where in the past we would race them as non-betters because of the non-competitiveness or the short fields uh, right. that, that were provided. So we've, we've benefited already by being able to use those, uh, those fields as betting races. And they've been highly, highly competitive uh, and, 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 and really featured a lot of uh, good competition um, on both sides of the uh, on both sides of the aisle, both the pacers and the trotters. Uh, there's two powerhouse uh, stables that provide horses for us. The Chip Campbell stable. He has some very very great horses. Uh, as you know, in 2013, he and his partners won the Hamiltonian with the Massachusetts eligible horse, which is the the, the biggest trotting race uh, that we have in the country. Um, and a lot of that horse's offspring is now making its way into the uh, into the program as well. Um, and also uh, the uh, Lindy Farms uh, uh, stable uh, breeding farm, which is a very large op operation uh, internationally known. And so the competition here is is is, is very very high, and uh, it's been right across the board. It's been been very good. And even you know the uh, the smaller breeders have been able to keep up as well. So. Uh, it's really a great story, and we we couldn't be any happier uh, uh, with with that program, you know, and, and as well as the the, the overnight horses that our our, mm -hmm. our horsemen have been providing, you know, the horsemen association has been providing as well. You know, we we've, we've we've grown every every season with uh, larger fields, and uh, our handle is uh, last year was it was it was a tough it was a tough ride, but this year uh, uh, our handle has been has been up. Uh, the same for the same couple of weeks, uh, you know, starting off the meet, not the same meets, of, not the same weeks of the year, but the same weeks as far as uh, the first two weeks, three weeks of our uh, of our meet. Right. No, it's 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 great to see. You know, I remember learning about the Racehorse Development Fund early, early on, and what it was expected to do, and it's really nice to to see the fruits of that. Um, uh, of those programs taken together with the efforts of all of you, uh, you know, bear fruits as intended. Yeah, I agree with that, Commissioner Sunika. This program really uh, shows the, um, it, it's, it's, it uh, indicates the, that the objectives of the Horse Racing Development Fund are, are being met. And uh, that's, a, that's a huge success. And of course, we, we think a lot about all the, the jobs associated that we see at the horse at the race track on the day of the races, but of course all the ancillary businesses that are supported in the green space that is preserved because of the success of the program. The ripple effects are enormous. I have to say, I was um, at opening day. It was a cold day, Steve, um, brisk, and uh, given all the protocols, I opted to stay outside, and it was very exciting. Um, and uh, and and, and it, it, it triggered for me really a restart for spring, uh, a really beginning of normalcy for me. Uh, and I'm glad to see that the program is off to a great start. So I also got to see North, who just went um, behind his video in that lead car. Did you have fun, North? I did. It's the best way to watch a race. Uh, <laughs> To be up there where the starters are, I mean, I, I did not, I, so I'm a little bit new to the harness racing side of it, uh, so the running start is, is different for me, and I didn't realize as you watch that race that some of those horses will, will bump up against that gate with their nose. I would have thought that, uh, I mean, they're ready to go. Um, sometimes when that starting car pulls away, it's, it's a lot to watch. It's, it's really cool. So, yeah, it was a great day. It was cold. It was a little brisk. Uh, but we've had a good we've had a good meet so far this year, and we're excited. And Steve and his team do a great job uh, making everything work for us out there. Yeah, and and PBC deserves a lot of credit for all that uh, the supports it provides. So thank you, yep. thank you, um, Mr. O'Toole. I think are we all set, commissioners?
I was just going to suggest, uh, Mr. O'Toole, you'll have to get the chair in, in the starter car. I've right? done it. I've done it. Oh, you did do oh, it? Oh, yeah. To like oh, in 2019. No, oh, 2019. Yeah. Best, day of, best day of my time on the commission. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's excellent to do. Uh, no, and I they've all been realize. wonderful, but that was the best day. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I think I, I'm, I'm not sure if that was permissible, but I did take a photo from the lead car and I texted it to my kids who are across the country and one said, wait, do they, do they try to catch the car? <laughs> they were confused as to what the, uh, what was going on. It's actually enormously exciting. I hope everybody, uh, the other commissioners have had a chance to do it, but um, really, really exciting. So, yes. all righty, um, Alex. You've had a big day today, but you have one. We don't. We don't need a vote on this item for um, Mr. O'Toole. Thank you for the update. I know we're going to get some more. The only thing I wondered if you could remind me of the dates for Claire Barton and Sphere of Massachusetts. Do you have those, Steve? Yeah, that's uh, July twenty fifth. It's a special Sunday uh, racing matinee at two o'clock. Thanks. Okay. You're gonna come out for that? It's on, it's on my calendar. Great. Okay. Can't wait to Thank see you it. Guys as well. And, and and it's gonna feel even better than it did feel in April because as we continue to see such favorable health trends. So everything's looking up. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank very you very much. much. Yeah. Now, Alex, I think you're on to your final item for today. Item E. Yes, um, this is the Mass Thoroughbred Breeders Association. Um, they uh, we are in a consulting role under 128, which is the um, agricultural uh, statute um, for um, how they, the different things that they can do with their um, breeders money. And so um, earlier this year, they um, brought some plans to us, um, there was a meeting with the chair, um, Commissioner Cameron, um, Council Grossman, Executive Director Wells and I, and a couple of uh, Arlene Brown and a couple of other people from the breeders, where we um, discussed their plans and talked about um, how we felt it fit in with the statute. Um, so this letter basically um, just um, puts into writing um, what we discussed at that meeting. Um, uh, Council Grossman had um, input in um, drafting it, um, as well as um, we had other comments on it too. And so it was kind of a group effort to get the letter together. Um, just some um, highlights. Um, <clears throat> one of the things they were requesting, to, or one of the, their plans was to um, pay out um, on races, um, to uh, the sixth place um, right now under the statute, it says to um, the third place. So um, I mentioned that um, they did want to change um, bonuses given to um, the uh, stallion mares and different owners um, through the breeding program. Um, and it was a 5% um, increase to the breeders and that um, definitely makes sense. They're trying to, um, think of ways to increase the breeding. Um, as you know, um, their program has um, had a tough time um, now that there's no longer um, racing at Suffolk. Um, they've had, uh, they have not had the, uh, been able to have the success that there has been on the standard, on the standard bread side. And they're trying to figure out um, how to navigate um, the situation that they're in now. Mm -hmm. um, then they did go on and, um, look at um, what they call breeders incentives. And right now under 128, there is not, nothing mentioned as breeding incentives. Um, this is something that we discussed with them as far back as um, uh, January of, uh, I'm trying to think of 2020. This was when um, uh, Council General uh, Justin Stempak was still here and Commissioner Cameron and I met with them and Justin and we're really trying to come up with um, some new um, ways that might incentivize breeding. And one of them was to actually um, 
give um, an amount of money out at different um, stages of the breeding. As um, you heard with the on the standard bread side today, it does take you know several years, three years at least, um, before you get a horse to the races and start seeing any return on your investment. And so the idea was if you um, maybe give a payment when the horse is bred, um, when the foal is born, um, when the foal is you know registered, that this would give um, an owner and the breeders some money along the way um, to help them through the program. Um, it sounds like a, um, a something that's worth trying to me. It's uh, definitely would um, help along the way, um, but I just it doesn't. Um, it's not mentioned in 128 now, and um, 128 is fairly specific. Um, they do start off general um, about talking about the Breeders Association um, doing what they can to promote and encourage um, thoroughbred breeding. Um, but then it gets more specific and it goes on to say in the following manner. And um, so right now, uh, breeders bonuses are not included in the statute. Um, I did want to say one thing. Um, Arlene Brown um, wishes she could be here today. Um, and she did give me permission to, to tell you all. Uh, she did get injured um, a little while ago um, with one of her uh, a two hour old foal <laughs> injured her and she ended up with several broken ribs and was mm -hmm. in the hospital for a little bit. So she is mending and she's at home now, but she, um, she isn't on the call today. Oh. It's dedication, it's her well. dedication to her, her profession. Oh, um, we all wish her well. Yes. Uh, questions for uh, Dr. Lightbound on both process and substance of the letter. Uh, this would, um, has not yet gone out to Arlene. It's public, but uh, um, is that correct, Ar um, Alex? That's correct. Yeah, you haven't signed it yet. Commissioners, Commissioner Cameron, I uh, see your hand. Yes, yes. You're a little Thank darker you. today for me to see you. I'm sorry. Right? Cool. The, the, just the lighting, it's fine. Okay. Um, so, first of all, I want to uh, wish Arlene Brown a speedy recovery. Um, I'm sure that uh, that new fold had sharp little legs that must have been kicking, right? And um, so I do wish her well. I just heard about that, her, her injuries um, as part of the work she loves and does well. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, I think the letter as outlined, um, it's our best advice, right? In our consultation role, um, it's how we think the statute should be um, interpreted properly and you know they asked for that and i think we're giving them um, the best advice we can so i certainly think it's an appropriate letter to um, to forward commissioner brian commissioner i i said no um todd if you had any thoughts you wanted to share on the process or the letter everything that's been said makes sense to me i just didn't know if you had anything to add no, thank you, uh, Commissioner. No, I think Alex did a beautiful job uh, summarizing uh, the contents of the letter and the thought that, uh, you know, was behind uh, everything there. So I, there's nothing really else to be added. So my understanding, Todd, the, um, we, you know, we have vote listed on the agenda, but technically we don't need to vote. It's the chair of the commission. So the, the consultation is technically with the chair. Uh, I think she's looking for input, but technically, as a consultation, the commission could go ahead and just give some input, and then uh, Alex could send out the letter, correct? That's exactly right. Okay. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, did you have any uh, concerns with respect to the content or the process? Um, the only thing I wondered was whether there was any sort of ongoing conversation. It, it kind of ends, um, you know, lauding their efforts and reminding them of things. I, I didn't know if there's another stage to this consultation, whether they come back with further information or whether this is the, the way we want to end it or you want to end it. I, I think we do get regular updates. Uh, Todd, do you want to advise? Well, I think it depends what their response to the recommendations 
is. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it perhaps does warrant an ongoing conversation. Um, they may agree with um, the points that are made in the letter and pivot off of what their initial proposal is. And if they want to move forward with some of those things, we've recommended they get legal counsel to offer them uh, some direction. So yeah, I think uh, a further uh, conversation is certainly appropriate, but it, a lot just depends on their reaction to these points. And then of course, they also have an obligation um, by statute to consult with the Department of, of Agriculture. Um, so that's, uh, I know Alex, you, you have channels of communication with that agency as well. Yeah. Uh, but I feel as though this, uh, by memorializing the consultation in writing, uh, really allows an opportunity for the Gaming Commission to, to, pro to provide its insights. And uh, we will continue to monitor um, and get updates uh, on, on uh, their practices. Commissioner Zunica, what do you think about the process and that substance? Are you all set? Yeah, uh, yeah, I look forward to their uh, response. I'm curious as to, I think that the letter articulates uh, well um, the, you know, the, the points and, and, and potential concerns, but uh, look forward to what uh, they have to see and go from there. Okay, hearing no objections, then I think that no vote is required. Um, we have a consensus that this is a, a, a good next step and, and you would sign this Dr. Lightbound and, and we'll get it out. Does that sound right, Karen? Yes. Okay. Alex, big, big day. And, and we're really on spot on time. If I understand uh, Marianne's uh, timing agenda, it is now 1140 and I think she allocated 20 minutes um, before we take a lunch break, uh, Karen. Okay. So, with that said, you can take more than 20 minutes, but I just okay. remember right. noting that that was the uh, timing. Excellent. Thank you so much, Marianne's Magic. And uh, we'll get started. You have a, a report today on regulatory review. Yes. Sorry, I'm on a meeting. Okay, sorry. I'm just hearing something behind me. All right. So, the next item on the agenda is the regulation review update. So, I've been working with um, uh, Commissioner Zuniga and uh, Attorney Carrie Teresi on the uh, so the process. So we just wanted to come before the commission. The um, the you know the process of having a regulatory review is certainly a, an excellent tool. It's a quality assurance tool to make sure that we're doing things the right way. We've been up and running for several years now. Uh, the time is clearly right to just take another look and, and review the regulations. Uh, so, you know, the team, we looked through some of the options and came up with some proposed 2021 regulatory review goals. Uh, those are in your uh, memo as, uh, number one, ensure regulations are clear, well-written, and understandable. Uh, two, eliminate, eliminate duplicative or contradictory requirements. Three, eliminate unnecessary and minimize overly burdensome requirements. Uh, four, ensure reporting requirements are necessary and provided information is used by regulatory agency. And four, eliminate barriers to equity and inclusion. So um, we've also, you know, talked a little bit of in, the, in the memo about, you know, why those, why those particular goals. Um, one was just ease of navigation. We you know, want this to be easy for our users to go through these and be able to understand them and go through them and be able to comply. Uh, the second reason was fairness. We want to do the right thing as an agency. Our agency is all about uh, integrity. So making sure that this is fair and we're doing the right thing uh, would be uh, an applicable goal for this regulatory review. And then the fourth was the reduction of unnecessarily, regu unnecessarily unnecessary regulatory burdens. So having um, you know, unnecessary things, things we don't use, superfluous information, that's really not required. So why, it's the why, asking for things because we're actually using them. So those are some of the, the reason behind it. And then uh, we've identified a proposed review process uh, led by, you know, Commissioner Zuniga, and I'll be working with him and the legal staff. Uh, the steps here that we've identified are number one, if 
this meeting some commission feedback on the proposed goals. Are these things that you think are, are worthwhile? There, is there anything we're missing? Just get some feedback from the commission. Uh, we'll need a form for the review process. Uh, Carrie Teresi, uh, uh, Teresi has all, already sort of done a draft review form for different uh, uh, members of the staff to fill out as they will through different sections. Um, one of the first thing we do is we would identify a set of regulations and associated documents co to commence the review. As they indicated in the memo, we can't do everything all at once. So we'll have to do this on a rolling basis. So we'll identify the first set of regulations. What do we want to look at first? Do that chunk. We may have some lessons learned there. Maybe we modify our process a little bit, but that would be um, the sort of the uh, initial uh, ideas go through them one at a time and have the group identify the first regs. Uh, we have a review team or working group for proposed regulations under review. That may change depending on the regulation. So, you know, for example, we go through the licensing regulations. Obviously, uh, Division Chief Skinner would be heavily involved in that process. And then maybe we get someone else that knows nothing about uh, licensing regulations. So someone that looks at them and says, hey, you know, that doesn't really make any sense to me because they've never seen them before can actually be really helpful as opposed to someone that sees them every day and assumes everybody knows what they mean. Uh, look at a uh, number five, look at a timeline, conduct a preliminary assessment of the regulation in question. Uh, it's also important to develop and implement a process for stakeholder input. We want to hear from the licensees, potentially maybe get some uh, input from different vendors or employees, just get some input on how these things are working. Um, we would then finalize any proposed regulatory revisions and then present them uh, to the commission for the normal approval process for any amendments. Um, so that's, that's sort of the outline. I did want to give particularly Commissioner Zuniga a chance to chime in on you know, his thoughts on the process and, and where we are and um, just thoughts on the goals and where we are as far as that identification. So I'm gonna make it, uh, I think you're on there. You go. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Karen. Um, yeah. If I if I may just uh, emphasize a couple of the key points uh, of this uh, of this summary, um, as as Karen started, uh, this really goes back to um, a, a good practice, a best practice that you identified, Kathy, early on about the the need and desire to to do a um, a regulatory review of. Um, and that could go back all the way to the beginning um, with the goals articulated. Um, there was a convergence um, with the um, equity and inclusion working group that you also um, uh, identified and, and, and implemented um, uh, a few months back and um, in which that becomes uh, another important goal as part of the regulation review. Um, and, and in keeping with the convergence theme, um, as the way that that uh, um, that we're envisioning the rolling basis and the working uh, uh, groups with different um, different elements of our staff, um, we will continue to involve, or the desire is to involve uh, people who have lived with these regulations and people who need to learn the regulations by virtue of either being new or being in a position where they are going to live with these regulations. Um, so that's part of um, the next steps. Um, at this point is to come for input on whether um, there needs to be more clarity on some of the goals. They're meant to be broad so that they apply uh, to all of them. Uh, or whether we need to be thinking about a particular sets of regulation to start with. Um, um, and, and before that, by the way, um, before I finish, uh, another another part that's not clearly stated, but we're here in this memo, but we clearly are anticipating would be uh, a necessity. Uh, we come to uh, modify regulations um, often. Idea, and the idea is not to replicate uh, any of those efforts. So whatever the legal department has already identified as necessary to address for, for whatever reason, that this would be an effort that would be done at, at the same time. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's elements about the rules of the game, for example, that are not stipulated in regulation, they're, they're referenced, 
Um, so there's other documents that this effort would, would by definition also touch on, forms, etc. cetera. Um, and again, the idea is not to replicate the effort, but to converge and focus as intended. And so one of the principles here that we've, we've talked about is also you don't want to overly complicate it. If you, if you make this simple, if you make it uh, direct and people easy, or it's easy for folks to understand this process of the regulatory review, it'll be uh, much easier for people to complete and we'll be able to move things along and I think get a better result. So um, that's one of the reasons the, you know, sort of we have, as, as uh, Commissioner Janiga mentioned, we have these high level uh, regulatory review goals that we're looking at. So, I mean, I think right now I'm just looking to see if there's any feedback on the goals um, and, and on the process, you know, um, if the commission is comfortable with that, we'll go uh, forward with the process and then we'll give regular updates on how we're going. Uh, and then uh, ultimately, if there's any recommended changes, they would come in front of the commission for an ultimate commission decision. Well, I'll chime in first, uh, just to get the ball rolling. Um, I am very, very pleased with uh, the the entire uh, presentation today, the memo. Um, it's straightforward, and, and I do think streamlining the process and keeping it simple um, will help you achieve the, the objectives that you've stated. This is a, a really good process to institutionalize, and of course, as it gets institutionalized, it gets easier, right? Um, and I think to Commissioner Zuniga's point, you know, we we um, are involved in rulemaking and, and regulations on an ongoing basis. Even in our role, commissioners, we, we will be thinking more of the goals um, and, 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 and we'll start, you know, and, and the legal department will be start write, writing um, regulations with these goals in mind and so it becomes really self-fulfilling. So um, you had a lot of regulations, commissioners, that you had to promulgate early on. So the time does seem right and and uh, um, I'm just pleased that given everything that you've had to address this year, that you've gotten this work going. I have one recommendation with respect to goals. I think it's probably in there, but I wonder if we want to articulate it, um, whether uh, a regulation is consistent with or uh, not in conflict with state or federal law because the regulation may precede a change in state law, so there probably needs to be a check on that. Okay. Probably doesn't arise very often, but uh, I think it's one of those things, Carrie and Todd will know it when they see it. And, and that's one of those things we can add to that form that we were talking about, as, as sort of an item for each regulation, make sure who's ever reviewing it checks that. Um, if it's, it's of it connected or derived from a state right. law, right, right. statute. Okay. okay. Yeah. That was my only, those are my only comments. Other, other comments, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know I like it also. My only comment in terms of the, um, the proposed goals, and it's somewhat covered when you say duplicative or contradictory, but we might have either complete um, or unnecessary in there. Okay. Yeah. Maybe yeah. There's a game we don't use that's not used, et cetera. And I don't see the point in having rules of the game necessarily, let's say, perpetuate if they don't exist in the jurisdiction. So to make everything cleaner too, to just keep an eye toward um, if we have regs that govern some equipment rule or game that just doesn't exist anymore, it might be worth taking a look at when you're okay. going. Take out. Okay. Got it. Uh, that looks okay. good. Okay. Thank you. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, Commissioner O'Brien. Um, are you all set? Yeah. Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, I, I agree that this is a, a worthwhile process, something that we need to do. I remember early on when we were, and Commissioner Zuniga will, will recognize, uh, will remember this as well. Um, you know, we had long kind of philosophical discussions about did we want to be overly prescriptive, which is really in some sense, it's, it's people know exactly what to expect and it might be easier to enforce them, but, or do we want to, you know, keep them, um, streamline them and let, let the licensees come to us. I'm in particular, I'm thinking about um, um, many of the uh, 
you know, whether it be the rules of the games uh, out at the casinos or any of the casino specific regulations, um, or do we let give some, make it shorter and let the licensees come to us and say, look, we think this fits. We think we can do it this way. And it gives, it gives them a little flexibility. So we had long discussions about that. And I think some of our regulations, we really did decide to keep them, um, just give some generics and let them come back to us with the specifics. And in others, we were pretty specific because um, some of our experts, you know, kind of uh, convinced us that was the way to go. So I think um, looking at that with a fresh set of eyes, um, Karen, I like that you said having someone else look at it that hasn't been in the weeds for years with regard to that subject. And is it understandable? Is it easy to understand what what we're expect what we're expecting? So I thought that was a really good point that you made about that fresh set of eyes that hasn't been working with that particular uh, set of regulations for years. So um, I, uh, when I saw all the goals, I thought they were excellent. I love the idea of getting back and taking a look at some of these things that we did years ago, because we now have um, a lot of expertise that we didn't have then. So, um, so good work, and it's really worthwhile endeavor. Thank you. Yeah, let, let me add to that, because I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent point. Um, the con I remember thinking about precisely that, the question that seemed at times unanswerable, how prescriptive do you want to be or how, uh, and, and, uh, or how flexible and broad, which is the, the counterfactual. And um, the difference now is that we have a lot more experience with whatever those um, approaches yielded in, uh, you know, in, in the, 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 the staff, because we flipped through them in the, the, the regulated entity, the licensees, et cetera. So um, it will be continue to be a, a question, but one that one with the goals, we can address with a lot more comfort, I would argue. Okay. I think I would, uh, just to add to that, um, without having the, been there historically, what I'm hearing is that um, there really is some values uh, judgment that's attached to this process. I like that you include fairness. Um, so if we go back to the values that were adopted by the commission early on, that drives the, the review process too. I don't know if you want to reference that, but I think we know that on a daily basis we work um, um, as a values-driven organization. And so the fairness factor jumped out at me and I was very pleased with that. Commissioner O'Brien? You're leaning in? Oh, okay. Kitty. Okay. <laughs> oh, the, the kitty's leaning in. <laughs> what is the, what is the main, um, uh, main... Oh, it's time for lunch, apparently. Oh, I, I wondered if he wanted to chime in on regulatory review. Yeah. Maybe on cat food standards. Um, all right. Uh, anything further on this uh, important matter? Uh, you streamlined not only the the process and and uh, the presentation, but you might have even streamlined ahead, four minutes ahead of the presentation time. So there we, we go. go. Off to a great start. Yeah, you never want to be the person holding people up from their lunch. So you know. <laughs> but that is our next thing on our agenda. Does that still make sense? Um, I think uh, uh, Chief Delaney will have the licensees coming in for their presentations after. Um, well, for the community mitigation first, and then the, the uh, two quarterly reports after our lunch. So what do we have, what did Marianne schedule for time? Uh, 12 to 12.30 for lunch, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So um, does that make sense? We'll, we'll break now and reconvene at 12.30. Excellent morning. Yeah, excellent morning, everyone. Thank you for all the contributions. It's just after 12.30, 12.33. And we are now turning to, I'll, I'll take a roll call to confirm virtually that we're all here. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, good afternoon, I'm here. Good afternoon. Commissioner O'Brien. I am here. And Commissioner Zuniga. Here. Okay, we can get started. We're reconvening at an item number 
seven, and that is uh, Chief Delaney. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone again for this morning. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, so for your consideration today, we have the final eight community mitigation fund grant applications. Um, these fall in the transportation planning, transportation construction, and community planning categories. Um, so after today's presentations and votes, um, we will come back before you one more time to give a final summary of everything and a, and a wrap up of the uh, Community Mitigation Fund for 2021. I think we've got that tentatively planned for, for June 3rd. So without further ado, I'll jump right into the uh, transportation uh, planning grant applications that we have. Um, the first one is the City of Boston, uh, the Sullivan Square design. So the city's requesting $200,000 for the ongoing design of long-term improvements uh, to Sullivan Square and Rutherford Ave. Um, approximately 70% of the casino related traffic travels through Sullivan Square. So really for this reason alone, the review team agrees that there certainly is a casino related impact on Sullivan Square. Now the commission has been funding this project for the last uh, few years. We've provided uh, to date a total of $850,000 towards this uh, design effort. If, if this grant is approved, that would bring the commission contribution up to 1.05 million, which makes up um, about nine and a half percent of the total design cost of $11 million. And the city has indicated to us that this should be their last request for design funds. So the, um, uh, the 25% plan design plans for this project have been submitted to MassDOT and they expect to have a public hearing in June. 75% um, design plans are expected to be submitted in early 2022 with the 100% plans submitted in the fall of 2022. And both Encore and MassDOT were in support of this application. So the review team agrees um, that this level of investment is appropriate considering that it will help leverage over $150 million in construction funds and recommends awarding a grant in the amount of $200,000 to the city of Boston. And with that, I will open that one up for any questions. Commissioners, any questions? Commissioners, anybody you're leaning in? Well, just, <clears throat> just to agree with the recommendation, I mean, I think, um, Anything relative to traffic and Sullivan Square is has been and continues to be a really, in my opinion, at the top of what the community mitigation might have intended, the community mitigation fund rather. Um, so I'm in full support of this uh, recommendation. Um, the bigger question becomes, you know, what happens after. But in the meantime, it's important to fund, you know, design money so that the, the work can progress. Joe, um, before we go on in terms of process, I'm reminded that <clears throat> we voted on all public safety um, applications, but we have heard the last, in our last commission meeting, um, we did uh, hear your recommendations as to some of the other categories. I don't think they're set forth in this document Ultimately, we want to vote category wise. Is that correct? Is that the process, Karen, that we're imagining? That Joe? Is muted. Yeah, that, that was my understanding. Please, Joe, chime in. Was yeah. They would do it in groups, correct? Yeah, uh, Commissioner O'Brien's been working uh, with Todd on, on uh, motions for that. And I think the idea is that we will, all of the ones that were remaining from the last meeting on the 6th, plus these will all be voted on at the end by category. Okay. And I believe, and Joe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's, um, there was a Northampton community planning that was outstanding to vote on today from the last meeting. Um, Is that the only one? No, no, there's, there, there's, um, there, I, believe, there's I had nine, I had nine plus, one, two, three, four. Is it 13 all in? Uh, 14. 14. All right. I may be missing one as we go through. I think through. the Northampton one was the one that was missing. Was that one? Okay. From so the that list. Yeah. 
Yeah, maybe um, in the interim, Todd, you can, um, we can see that list all together. I'm just trying to keep my head straight um, in terms of transportation planning grant applications. Yep. Um, yeah, I have the 14. Yeah, 14. Okay. All right. So maybe as we're doing these, we can think about whether there are some other, I guess I'm, what I'm hearing is we're going to conclude, but if we're doing transportation planning now, could we? Um, I think maybe if I could suggest as Joe goes through each category, Joe, if you just want to make a reference to anything yeah. in that category we discussed at the last date, um, and that would sort of close out that category. That's, know, right. That's what I'm looking for. Commissioner O'Brien, thank you for filling in my words because I wasn't being very clear. That would help at least me think about our categories. If, right. if we're, does that make sense, Joe? Does that work for you? I don't want to. No, that, yeah, that's fine. Um, let me just. Because um, we've got a few transportation planning grant ones now. So yeah, let me do, just. But I'm just yeah. going to note it as I go along so I can keep track of them in my head. I had intended to do that last night and I just didn't get to it. My apologies, Joe. No, no worries. I just, I'm just uh, quickly opening up that document just from my own screen so I have sure. it. Um, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. That will keep us organized. Okay. All right, now. Okay, so I think then we're all set on the Boston one, right? <clears throat> yep. Commissioners, and so moving on to Malden. Sorry to put a. Oh, no problem. No your problem. Cadence. Thank you. Um, so the next one is Malden um, Broadway improvements. Um, so the city of Malden is requesting $200,000 to start the design of improvements to Broadway from the Everett City Line to the Melrose City Line. Um, and this request will also advance the design of one area of Broadway, Broadway near the Everett line to full bid documents. Now, the, the environmental impact for the Encore project estimated that about 1% of the traffic generated by Encore will use Broadway in Everett and Malden. Uh, in addition, Malden serves as a transportation hub for Encore with shuttle buses going to and from the uh, Malden Center T station, um, there are also a substantial number of Encore, Encore employees living in Malden um, that, that may also use this route. So the review team agrees that all these together, you know, it certainly constitutes an impact on the Broadway corridor, although that uh, impact is relatively minor. Um, now the total construction cost for these improvements on Broadway is estimated at $8 million and it's expected to be funded through the state's uh, transportation improvement program. A full design of these improvements would be expected in the 800,000 to a million dollar range. So if we consider sort of a maximum all in cost of about $9 million, the contribution that the community mitigation fund would be making would be about 2.2% of the total project costs. Um, you know, while the, uh, Review team agree that there is an impact on Broadway. It is relatively minor, with an estimated increase in traffic of about 250 vehicles per day. You know, therefore, we had to consider whether the proposed community mitigation funds were uh, proportional to the impact. Now, considering that the cost of this work would only add up to about 2.2% of the total project cost, the review team uh, certainly felt uh, that this was proportional. Uh, and both MassDOT and Encore were in favor of this project. And just, you know, by comparison, this project is very similar to the project that we funded up in Lynn last year on Western Ave, where we were looking at it as, uh, even though the impact on the road is fairly small, we felt that providing sort of some seed money to get the project started was appropriate. And um, we look at that, this project as being very similar to that. So for all of these reasons, um, the review team recommends awarding a grant in the amount of $200,000 um, to the city of Mall. And with that, I will open that one up for any questions. Any questions? I think you're all set, Joe. Okay. And of course, we're moving, we've had the benefit of also a, an excellent briefing. 
Um, so the next one is West Springfield, um, the Elm Street improvements. Um, they are requesting $147,600 to design complete streets improvements to Elm Street and Southworth Street and to also purchase some traffic counting equipment. So really, um, this is essentially kind of a four part request. The first is a redesign of a portion of Elm Street. The second part is extending the limits of that earlier project further down Elm Street. The third is extending the limits of that earlier project to a portion of Southworth Street. And the fourth um, is the purchase of the traffic counting equipment. Um, the review team is not recommending funding uh, for this project for several reasons. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to give a little bit of a history lesson on this, if you'll indulge me for a couple of moments, um, just to put it in context. So back in 2017, the commission awarded a grant to West Springfield for complete streets improvements to Elm Street, which is the same project that we're dealing with here. Um, the design that was advanced would have resulted in the loss of some parking in the area to accommodate bike lanes. Now, after the plan was complete, a meeting was held with the business community on that plan and the loss of uh, parking on street was not uh, well received. So the town decided that they uh, would reevaluate, they want to reevaluate the location of the bike lanes and, uh, and redesign that section oh, of the road. So this um, uh, uh, okay. Lisa, is part of the Lisa, Thank you, okay. <laughs> We didn't want to hear her um, her phone call. So sorry, Joe. Speak, you could start again. No worries. Um, so essentially, you know, the review team uh, just didn't believe that it should be the role of the CMF uh, to be funding the redesign of work. You know, had the issues around parking been raised earlier with the business community, this redesign effort could have been avoided. Um, and then the second part of this, the review team really couldn't identify an impact of the casino that is associated with the expansion of the work. So the expansion of the project on Elm Street appears to be due only to the proposed relocation of the bike lanes and is beyond the limit of Route 20 where casino related traffic impacts are generated. Um, the proposed expansion of the project onto Southworth Street is associated with the construction of a new school. Now there are some, this, the city, the town has some proposed changes uh, in the traffic flow that would bring some of the traffic from the school out to the intersection of Elm Street and Southworth Street. You know, and while an increase in traffic at that location may be of concern, that new traffic is an impact of the school and not the casino. And with respect to the traffic counting equipment, the review team felt that this really was more of a general municipal expense rather than a response to a casino related impact. Um, and both MassDOT and MGM both expressed some reservations regarding this project. So uh, again, we are not recommending this one and um, I'd be happy to answer any uh, questions regarding this application. Questions? So, um, I just had one point of clarification that I might be helpful to. I think that when we were talking about it, there was some discussion about whether you could determine, um, I know if they had re if they'd submitted the application with the current bike lane plans, there arguably would have been a need to do a small section at one end to have the bikes, you know, come back in where they needed to connect. Uh, but it's, is it accurate to say that there was no way to determine how much of the grant application would have pertained to that discrete section? Yeah, we did ask um, the town to provide us if, if they could provide a breakdown of sort of the pieces of this. And they just, they indicated that, you know, the, the proposal that they got from their consultant was kind of a lump sum proposal for the whole thing and that, that they couldn't really break out the costs of the pieces of it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I had that same question. So the, the uh, full amount was the $147,600. And no, the application doesn't suggest any kind of a line item analysis, correct? No, except for the traffic counting equipment, which um, I don't have that number right in front of me, but as memory serves, it was about, that was about 9,000, I think. And, and Joe, the thought was, um, can, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. 
Okay, the thought was that um, traffic counting now after the fact really um, doesn't serve any purpose, correct? Because we didn't have a baseline? Well, yeah, I think if, you know, if this, if this request had been done maybe before the opening and they were trying to use this equipment to establish baselines and, and, and evaluate the actual impacts of the casino, um, it might have more merit. Um, you know, buying the equipment now, um, while they could certainly use it to count traffic on Route 20 and on Memorial Ave, you know, some of the, the major routes to the casinos, um, I don't, it wouldn't really provide any particular um, utility because you wouldn't be able to parse out what traffic is casino related and what isn't. Um, so we felt that really, I mean, and, and look, communities all over the Commonwealth have traffic counting equipment and they use them in neighborhoods when people are complaining about cut through traffic and other things. And, uh, you know, so it's, um, uh, it seemed more like a general municipal expense rather than in, in any kind of direct response uh, to the casino. This, as well as the other three items really do get back to the fact that the team could not make a nexus to the casino, correct? Yeah, you know, I think certainly on the expansion work, we didn't really find the nexus. Now, of course, on the area that they're asking for redesign, you know, a certain portion of the traffic, about 5% of the MGM traffic is estimated to use Route 20. So two years ago, uh, I was saying four years ago, when we approved the grant, we made that connection. We said, sure, there is an impact on that section of Route 20. So that piece of it is more of the of the fact that we're saying that we we probably just shouldn't be funding redesign of work that had been done previously, um, and so the other three pieces of it are, are are sort of the nexus to the casino wasn't really made, and that one piece of it is more maybe we shouldn't be funding the redesign of of work that we already funded. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? We can circle back to, you know, as we, we hear um, the other recommendations. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so that concludes the transportation planning. And maybe I can just give you the rundown of the ones that, that we've covered between this meeting and the last meeting. So, mm -hmm. Under transportation planning, um, of course, we just covered the Boston Sullivan Square. Mm -hmm. At the last meeting, we covered Chicopee, the Chicopee Center uh, streetscapes. Mm -hmm. um, at the last meeting, we also covered the Everett uh, Mystic River Walk, that little piece of boardwalk that they want to build. Um, in Malden, the Broadway improvements that we just talked about. Um, and that is, those are all of the ones that we are recommending and then there are the two uh transportation planning grants that we are not recommending one was in lynn which was the traffic and safety improvements at boston street and hamilton street and the other one was west springfield the elm street improvements um, that we just discussed Commissioner O'Brien, I know that you worked with Todd on this. Um, I, if, if this is the end of this particular category, does it make sense that we um, finalize discussion on this and do our voting now? I mean, I think it, for me, it might help me keep organized in my process. Um, yeah, that's fine. So what Todd and I had done is grouped what was still outstanding by category. Um, consistent with the recommendations of the working group um, and the team. And then we can obviously change that. I mean, if the consensus is that we are voting, you know, contrary to that, it's very easy to just swap them out. And then to have a definitive vote rejecting anything that was not recommended. Um, and if we agree with that, then there'd be a sort of a secondary motion for that grant topic it's declining the applications. So if you want to move um, now on the transportation planning or have discussion to see if we're ready to move on transportation planning, we can do that. I think um, last, last time we discussed, we were going to vote on categories. So, 
for me, I think it makes sense to do it now. And then also it allows us the opportunity if we want to do a item by item vote, we could. Um, right. Commissioner Cameron, remember I, I mentioned this last week. I did, I make it easier for me too, just to, we have all of these fresh in our mind, the ones that, um, you know, uh, the, the committee recommends and the two that they don't. So I, I agree that it may be easier yeah. to just vote on this piece now. Right, and then if we don't have a clear consensus, we can do a, a, an item by item vote. Um, you know, we, we're in a position to do that. Is that okay, Joe? Works for me. All right. So um, I just, I wanna um, just go back to West Springfield. I, I'm, I'm not sure entirely because I, we don't have all the information in front of us, but I might have thought differently. Um, if there could have been a breakdown of the the project into smaller pieces and maybe have been might have been persuaded for a partial funding, particularly with respect to the biking piece. Um, I don't know if any of my fellow commissioners had that had similar feelings. I, I did, and that's why I asked um, Joe to clarify, just because I I asked that and he they went back and asked for that information and it was not forthcoming. So that's something for the future, um, perhaps even in our trainings, Joe, to say that you might wanna be prepared for the commission in case they, they are likely to do a partial funding for, to the extent it can be segregated. I know that not all projects are subject to segregation, but. Yeah, because I think that's, you know, we have clearly done partial funding on, on many, Grants, right. you know, and those are typically ones that sort of are broken out by category where we can, you know, it was mostly the public safety ones. It's easier to do because you usually have a, an itemized list. Itemized list, right. Any other comments or observations, commissioners, before we um, move on on a motion from Commissioner O'Brien? Um, just just to mention that I support the recommendations both to award and decline in the case of this category. Um, and I think it's important that is now in the record what Joe stipulated relative to the West Springfield request um, to reconcile the fact that we did in fact fund um, a design in the past, but given the facts and circumstances since then, uh, we are now recommending that we do not fund this request because it includes a number of other aspects, including the fact that there's a rework on uh, planning, uh, uh, planning activities that should have been anticipated um, if it was done uh, properly. Thank you. Yeah, I, I as well, uh, during a briefing, had a lot of questions about this one. As, and had the same uh, answers, meaning they weren't able to uh, break it up, which makes it difficult for the review team and for us to move forward when we clearly know that certain aspects are not covered. There is no nexus to the casino. So I, um, I think the review team did, a, did an excellent job in really thinking through every aspect and, um, and coming to what can be hard decisions. You know, you, you don't want to, deny um, worthwhile projects, but then we have to follow um, the law as well. So um, I'm in agreement as well with, with uh, those that the team recommended and the two that they did not. Thank you. And, and I, I'm in agreement with Commissioner Cameron's uh, um, comments. I feel exactly the same way. With that said, Commissioner O'Brien, do you want to take a stab at this? Uh, certainly. Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the award of the following grants from the Community Mitigation Fund, specifically pertaining to transportation planning, namely uh, an application from Boston for $200,000 for Sullivan Square, Rutherford Avenue, uh, to Chicopee for $200,000 for the Center Streetscapes, to Everett for $200,000 for the Mystic River Walk, and to Malden, $200,000 for the Broadway improvements. Uh, these grants are for the purposes described in the memos in the commissioner's packets and submitted applications as discussed here today, as well as on May 6th, 2021. 
and that we further uh, commission staff be authorized to execute a grant instrument commemorating the award in accordance with 205 CMR 153.04. I second that motion. Thank you. Any further questions for Joe or Commissioner Seneca? Okay. And uh, to Mary Thurl, always thank you. Um, and, and Tanya. Um, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Seneca. Aye. And I vote yes, 4 0. Tanya, thank you so much. Tanya's doing double duty here. Yes. <laughs> At least you're um, familiar with the, the subject matter. That's excellent. Okay. And Madam Chair, to close out um, the category of the transportation grant applications, I would further move that the commission deny the following applications to the Community Mitigation Fund uh, for transportation planning, namely Lynn for the design improvements and West Springfield for the Elm Street improvements. I second that motion. Any further questions? Okay. Um, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote yes. Thanks, Tanya, for zero. Thank you. Moving on. Okay. So now we are into the transportation construction uh, grants. Um, so the first one uh, is the city of Boston, the um, project title Connecting the Lost Village. Um, so Boston's requesting $239,000 uh, for geometric changes to the intersection of Brighton Street and Cambridge Street in Charlestown uh, to create safer crossings and better lines of sight for turning vehicles. Um, once again, I think we need to take a little uh, trip down memory lane on this one to get a little uh, context. Um, so Boston requested funds for this project last year. Um, the total project cost is $534,000 and the commission awarded a grant of $295,000 last year. So the reasons that we had for reducing the request from 534 to 295 were because the transportation construction category was fiscally constrained last year where we had about 5.5 million in requests, where we had $3 million of funds available. And also the 2020 guidelines anticipated that there would be a significant local match. Now in 2021, we changed the guidelines a little bit on uh, transportation construction and established a maximum uh, community mitigation fund contribution of one third of the total construction costs with the ability to obtain a, wave, a waiver if the applicant can affirmatively demonstrate that the cost of the impact exceeds that one third um, threshold. So the city of Boston has requested that waiver. Now, the waiver itself didn't specifically bring us any new information, um, but you know, the city's argument is that since 70% of Encore related traffic um, goes through Charlestown, goes through Sullivan Square, that this tra traffic will increase the number of vehicles using local streets, uh, increasing the risk of pedestrian injuries and creating a heavier traffic flow. Now, you know, the thing that the, that the review team struggled with a little bit on this is that, you know, absent any kind of a, a detailed study of these local streets, it's really difficult to affirmatively demonstrate a, cas a casino related impact on these lesser roads. Although it is certainly reasonable to expect there to be some impact uh, you know, due to the proximity of the casino and the number of uh, casino related vehicles using Sullivan Square. So um, he, you know, we thought sort of long and hard about this and you know, I don't think anybody would reasonably expect that the city of Boston would have done detailed pre and post development studies on this, you know, small neighborhood in Sullivan Square. So not having that data, um, you know, is, is sort of uh, where we were struggling. Um, and with that said, uh, you know, both MassDOT and Encore were uh, supportive of this project. So, you know, given these uh, issues, the review team 
uh, did not make a recommendation on this application. Uh, as we considered generally just a policy decision on whether or not the applicant met the necessary threshold for a waiver. And so just, I just want you to think about a couple of things as you deliberate on this um, application is first, you know, that while no hard numbers have been presented, it is certainly reasonable to conclude that there is some impact to the neighborhood uh, just due to the proximity to the casino. Second, um, you know, the transportation construction category is not fiscally constrained this year. We have the, the, the requests are lower than our target threshold. And lastly, um, you know, this is a this project has a it's a relatively modest cost. Um, it's just a little over half a million dollars, and it will certainly have some uh, great benefits uh, for the neighborhood that it's it, that it's intended to serve. So with that, I guess I will open it up for questions and um, for the commission's uh, deliberations on this. So this one we we might want to treat singularly because there's not a recommendation coming out of the uh, review team. I see Commissioner O'Brien maybe nodding her head. What do you think? So, I mean, I had that highlighted as something that obviously was not subject to a recommendation. Um, what I thought would be is if we're done with the other items in that category and we've come to a conclusion on that, we can do it as part of that category. Sing we're something we're out. struggling with, we can clear the docket on everything else and single it out. Because it's really a request for a waiver um, without a potential of uh, uh, a recommendation. I, I guess there just wasn't a clear consensus. It's not as though you wouldn't wouldn't be willing to make um, a recommendation on a waiver request. It's just that you didn't have a clear consensus. So you're, you're passing it on to us. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> Which we appreciate. Um, what do you think? Commissioner Zinnica, did you want to comment first? Yeah, I think um, I, I think Joe articulated well the aspects, and, and let me just uh, expound on the last one, um, which is the notion that this is a discrete uh, project that can be funded and executed with, with the monies that we've already awarded. Uh, if we look back or zoom out of, of all construction, I'm sorry, transportation-related grants, planning, uh, um, you know, et cetera, uh, projects, th these kinds of projects are usually part of a much, much larger effort and the realization that our own uh, uh, ability to fund them either acts as a seed uh, money or let the, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a way to hopefully uh, some of those planning efforts becoming a catalyst for future um, state and federal funding even. Um, and the fact that we could do and make a difference with this uh, funding alone um, in an area that is clearly, you know, one of the most impacted uh, by traffic from the casino is, in my view, compelling. Um, and, uh, you know, elsewhere, uh, we have also uh, funded a, a number of projects with, you know, 2% traffic, et cetera, and the proportionality uh, I think, again, that given the size and proximity, that this is one that, um, you know, that is worth of finding and then realizing the full effect by, by seeing the construction through. Thank you. Very helpful. Commissioner Cameron, do you want to comment? Uh, yes, I am in favor of a waiver. I, I believe that um, without hard numbers, you can reasonably assume there would be uh, impact, um, again, because of the proximity. So um, I think this, this is one of those cases where a waiver would be warranted. Michelle Bryan. I, I would agree with that for what's been stated and also for the fact that part of the reason the cap was there was to make sure that applicants were going and getting um, funding from other sources if it was available. So not only is it unusual to have something that can be carved out this small, it's, and Joe, you can correct me if I'm wrong in your experience, but it would seem probably not as many options to go get outside funding for a project this small either, I mean, unless you can tie it into a bigger project. So given the nature of how everything's working at Sullivan Square and then this neighborhood that's kind of cut off um, by city limits in Sullivan Square, to me, 
it, it does seem that a waiver is appropriate. And I'm in agreement with all, everyone's statements, uh, in, including, of course, the, the reasoning that you offered, um, Joe. So I think we have a consensus um, from the four of us. Um, I, I must say I'm curious as to uh, what the counter arguments were made because I don't, uh, except I suppose that maybe the notion that wasn't as affirmatively put forth, I feel as though that's mitigated by all the, the, the points made today. Yeah, I think, I think you know, on, on sort of that other side of the argument a little bit was, and I'm gonna use the example of our, our friends in Chelsea last year, you know, to justify their project, they went out and did traffic counts before opening of the casino and after and really worked up a really great demonstration of that impact, um, you know, with, with real hard numbers. And that sort of seemed to be that really affirmatively demonstrating. Um, and here it was just sort of something less than that, you know, so we were all kind of like, eh, does it, does it, and we've never really done a waiver before. So, it, you know, does this meet the threshold or not? And I think, you know, um, sort of it's, it's that, you know, I, I guess I know it when I see it uh, kind of thing, uh, rather than saying it has to be this, 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 and this. And that's a judgment call. That's what it comes down to is it's, you know, some people could look at it saying, well, I think it demonstrates and other go, yeah, I don't think so much, you know. I think um, I'm, I'm not as troubled by the fact that maybe particular communities didn't do a, a traffic count. I think the casinos did do the traffic counts and there's evidence that Sullivan Square is significantly impacted. And I think that is sufficient to, to make, as Commissioner Cameron points out, that reasonable deduction that this community, which is kind of a little bit to the side, we don't want to, I know that there's much more pedestrian traffic going through and, and all, all beneficial as the casino is hiring so many local um, employees. So um, I'm comfortable with that. I do want to point out that we just denied West Springfield. Mm -hmm. um, and I do see contrasts in their applications. Um, most notably, if, if MassDOT and um, the licensees had supported West Springfield in a different way, I would have probably pressed more um, as to why we were, not, um, you know, sometimes we're just confined by our statute. And I would have pressed more on West Spring, Spring, Springfield. I also saw the map that you offered, Joe, and that made me realize it's quite different in impact than what we're seeing with respect to the Lost Village here. Well, right, and, and you need to remember that um, about 5% of MGM's traffic was projected to use Route 20, and 70% of the traffic is projected to use Sullivan Square. Um, right. You know, so it, it is, I think it's a little bit of an apples and oranges. It really that. is, and I just wanted to point that out for the record. I, 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 want, I, I reflected on that, especially when I'm hearing traffic counting, and we just denied them the ability to count traffic. You know, can't turn back the clock, so I don't really want to use it as standard that they had to have done the traffic count back you know, in 2015 or, you know, whatever for the going forward, right? Enrique, I think you're seeing my point. That would be a tough measure. Um, but we do have some broad, broad um, data from the early openings, right? From the casinos themselves. Yes. Yep. So we can do some reasonable deductions. But I do applaud. Chelsea had a great application last year. Yeah. It was excellent. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and so as far as voting on this, I, I'm not sure, and, and Todd, I, I'll, I guess I'll defer to you on this, but I don't think you really need to vote the waiver necessarily. As long as you vote the dollar value, it's essentially tacitly approving the waiver, right? Yeah, I think that sounds right. Okay. Commissioner O'Brien, are you fine with that? I'm fine with that because we've had a detailed discussion about it. I think if we hadn't, we'd probably have to specifically address it, but I think because we have discussed it in detail, I think that it would be satisfied with that. Okay, we have a full consensus. Okay, okay. And moving on, Joe, thank you very much. Okay, uh, so I, am I, is everybody else uh, I, Okay, yeah, thank you, Joe. Okay, so the next one that we have up is Revere and Saugus uh, Route 1 improvements. 
So the two communities are, are jointly requesting $800,000 to construct improvements to Route 1 North between the Overlook Ridge development and Route 99. Um, you know, just right out of the gate, you know, the review team certainly agrees that there is a, a connection to the casino here, you know, as it's uh, determined about 9% uh, of the patrons and employees are projected to use that stretch of, of Route 1. So that certainly constitutes um, an impact on the roadway. Um, now, again, the, today we, there's a bit of background on a lot of these projects. Um, so this project came out of earlier transportation planning grants um, that studied the issues associated with Route 1. So Revere and Saugus identified two projects and have been working with MassDOT to scope them out. Now, both of these projects were submitted to MassDOT and they were both determined to be eligible for state and federal funding. Um, in the end, MassDOT decided to take on one of the projects themselves and Revere and Saugus would be responsible for the other project, which is the one that's in front of you today. So the total estimated cost of this project is uh, $2.4 million with 800,000 coming from the Community Mitigation Fund. So that meets with our one third rule. They, we would be providing one third of the funding, MassDOT providing the other two thirds. Um, now the one hitch on this application is that our guidelines uh, require construction projects to be underway by June 30th of 2022. In this case, the project will not be ready to, bid, to go to bid in that time frame, since it has to go through the full mass dot design and approval process. However, the cities felt that having the Gaming Commission commitment to one third of the project costs would improve their chances of getting on the mass dot funding in an earlier year, you know, because you know, the way the MassDOT funding works, there's a finite amount of money and there's a whole bunch of projects and, you know, projects sometimes have to get moved from year to year and then a project that's supposed to go one year isn't ready to go and they have to shift something back in. There's a lot of moving parts to get a, a project funded and built by the state. So their feeling is that having this, this commitment would improve their chances of getting it moved up as early as possible. So they have requested a waiver from the June 30th, 2022 deadline. Um, they didn't um, ask for a time certain on it, but just, just a sort of a, a general waiver. Um, now at the same time, the city also looked at the possibility of advancing certain pieces of the project faster than the main project to try to meet that June 30th, 2022 date. Um, you know, it's, it's, it was a good effort to look at this, but you know, this unto itself creates a whole host of other issues. They would have to pull that piece out of the bigger project and it would still need to go through some mass dot reviews and other things. Um, and you know, that could even delay the main project further. Um, and basically the review team was not comfortable with that approach. Um, we're sort of comfortable with just, you know, follow the mass dot process the way it's designed and go through your, your reviews and your design and, and move the project ahead as expeditiously as you can. Um, so we are recommending an award of $800,000 to Revere and Saugus for the Route 1 North improvements with the stipulation that none of these funds can be expended until MassDOT awards a construction contract for that project. It further recommends granting a waiver from the June 30th, 2022 deadline and extending it out to June 30th, 2023. In essence, giving them an additional year to get the project underway. And with that, I will open that up for questions. Questions? Comments? Yeah, I, um, I'm in favor of this uh, recommendation. I think the what we placed in terms of guidelines relative to timing was well intended, but the way that the interests are converging here, and as Joe explained, trying to parse out uh, different aspects of the project uh, in order to meet that uh, guideline ended up, you know, complicating things, uh, you know, further. Um, I think uh, um, one of the things that I will later recommend or you know talk about when we 
do the debriefing or the wrap up in the next commission meeting about my experience here in this community mitigation review team is how much you gain by hearing a lot of these back and forth with the communities uh, when they articulate from their standpoint, the history, the intent, um, and, and, and whatnot, uh, uh, you know, that you don't really ascertain perhaps when you just read the, the grant request. Um, so I think I'm, I'm in favor of this, um, of this recommendation with, with the waiver, uh, and especially with the stipulation that, uh, that would then, uh, uh, you know, uh, complete the notion of um, making sure that, uh, that these monies act as a catalyst without having to spend them first, as a catalyst for the larger project, which is what we want them to do. If I, if I can uh, add to that, I, I, that was the compelling piece to me was um, having this money um, from us up front, one third really may help them move this whole project along, along. I thought that was a very compelling piece of information to learn about this application. So I, I agree with it, with the recommendation of the review team as well. I agree. And I also like um, not only the waiver, but also the condition, however, that it, you know, sort of is essentially escrowed until everything is ready to get off the ground. That way, for whatever reason, it doesn't, um, you know, it can be revisited. Okay, I'm in agreement with all of that. Um, are we just now noting this is the um, Revere and Sagas. And should we move on then? Yeah, so, so that, oh, actually, that's the last one. And this that's is the last question. of the transportation construction project. So let me just give you the rundown of all of the ones from last time and this time. Um, so at the last meeting, we went over the Everett Northern Strand Trail lighting improvements, um, which we are recommending. What was the, outside the community again? Uh, that was Everett. Oh yeah, that's right. The lighting, the lighting improvements on yeah. the Northern Strand Trail. Yep. Um, Revere in August, which we just went over. Um, and also uh, Springfield, which was the resurfacing of Dwight Street. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, now the city of Boston with um, the Lost Village. So we are recommending approval then of all of the of the um, transportation construction applications. As I have four. Yeah. Right. Um, two. That's Yep. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions on any of the individual um, applications before perhaps Commissioner O'Brien moves? Does it make sense to go forward then? Okay. Um, Madam Chair, uh, are you ready for the motion? Or? Well, I guess actually we're not doing the four. It would be the three, right? Because we're not voting on the, the waiver. Well, but we still need to vote on the oh. actual awarding of the monies. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you. Sir. Yep. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the award of the following grants from the Community Mitigation Fund uh, pertaining to transportation construction, uh, namely a grant to Boston for $239,000 for the Lost Village Project, to the City of Everett $135,000 for the Northern Strand Trail Lights, uh, to Revere and Saugus, $800,000 for Route 1 North improvements, subject to both the conditions and the waiver in the memo discussed today, uh, and $200,000 to the City of Springfield for Dwight Street improvements. These grants are for the purposes described in the memos in the Commissioner's packet and the submitted applications, as discussed both here today and on May 6th, 2021, and further, the Commission staff be authorized to execute grant instruments commemorating these awards in accordance with 205 CMR 153.04. Second. Any further questions, edits? Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote yes, four zero. Tanya, thank you. 
Great, Joe, moving on. Okay. So we are moving on to the community planning grant applications. So the first one is for the city of Lynn. Uh, they're requesting $100,000 to uh, develop a marketing campaign to promote Lynn businesses and uh, to better compete with Encore's marketing capabilities. Um, this will include a multimedia approach, including a website, billboard advertisements, social media, uh, visitor outreach, among other uh, means. Uh, to demonstrate a casino impact, the city referenced the loss of shows at the Lynn Auditorium and the um, spin-off losses associated with that at you know, local restaurants and so on um, uh, due to competition from the casino. Um, the review team agreed that, that, that through this um, demonstration that they established a nexus to a casino related impact. Um, the review team agrees that this approach will help the city of Lynn showcase its offerings to casino patrons and the general public and help offset the marketing advantages of Encore and recommends awarding a grant in the amount of $100,000 to the city. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Questions? Come here. I, no, I just have a question so much as a comment that um, I think Joe, when, when you were briefing me on this too, you commented on the, the level of specificity they had in terms of impact um, and being able to point to a specific event um, that I, I actually think is pretty compelling in terms of nexus and appropriateness of the award. Yeah, you know, many of these applications struggle with that connection to the casino and they were able to identify, you know, a particular instance um, that uh, where they lost business uh, to the casino and, you know, that was for us, you know, compelling that they were able to make a real, a real connection to, to an impact. Yeah, we um, will we'll remember that uh, we discussed uh, the, the idea in the last agenda setting meeting to come back and look at the uh, impacted live entertainment venues as part of a larger sort of view of this of these aspect. Uh, notwithstanding that, I think they, um, the, this is a similar request to what other communities have requested in terms of promotion of their um, their capabilities and their, their, their amenities in, in the city to take advantage of visiting patrons or, or to maintain some of the patrons that they want to continue coming to their downtowns. Um, so I, I agree with this um, recommendation and um, I look forward to the further larger discussion relative to impacted life entertainment events that may or may not inform future guidelines, by the way. Right, thank you. I fully support this recommendation. I, I feel it's spot on in terms of um, uh, what the uh, legislature might have imagined when they imagine mitigation, you know, outside of course, the obvious transportation issues and safety issues. I think this really, really works. And I hope that um, Malden, um, no, not Malden, I'm sorry, um, Lynn can benefit from $100,000. You know, it's not very much money, so. And, you know, as part of this, they also do have, the city themselves are putting in 25,000, and I think the, called, uh, I can't remember what organization um, uh, is putting in another 25,000. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, a little bit of a different budget than um, mm -hmm. our life to see next door. So I'm very pleased to support this one. Commissioner Cameron? No, I, I was, it was a great, I, I agree with all of you. This is really worthy. Um, but it was also nice to um, hear a little bit, learn a little bit about the uh, outstanding talent they get to, to Lynn. Um, I did not realize that maybe um, I'm uh, dating myself with that because a lot of them are the older older um, singers and whatnot that we that we know but um, yeah excellent and um, happy to help contribute if we can um, for them to continue to be strong in this area and and you know and leverage uh, the the casino you know work on from it i i noted the same when joe um with tanya went through the list with me i looked at tanya going like <laughs> I may not know who Sue, some of those 
Thompson. Great so names. I you know, and and it would be really fun to see, but I and and Tanya, if we could, I would love to take you to those those shows just to show how much fun they would be. Um I'll go to a North Wind and Fire show with you anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um so we have a next one for community planning, Malden Broadway zoning. Yes, so Malden is requesting $50,000 for a zoning improvement analysis of the Broadway corridor. Um, so the commission funded a study um, known as the Broadway Corridor Framework Plan a couple of years ago. Um, and that sort of looked at, at the whole Broadway corridor at a very high level. And out of that came a couple of recommendations. One was to Relook at the whole Broadway corridor as far as traffic and and uh, and you know uh, multi uh, uh, modal use of that pedestrians bikes and so on which we just agreed to fund a, a, a transportation planning study for that another recommendation that came out of that was to look at the um, the zoning along that Broadway corridor and um, you know making the connection to the casino is a little more difficult on this, but I think what we looked at this as is that, uh, and when we talked with the with the city, you know, the current zoning down there is this kind of mishmash of light industrial and you know, automotive uses and you know uh, strip mall kind of stuff. It's really kind of, like I said, a mishmash of different uses. But you know, the the types of things that can be developed there under the underlying zoning are not these things that are really sort of complementary to a, um, to a casino type use or to a resort type use. So this, you know, sort of inefficient zoning, if you will, um, is creating some sort of lost opportunity costs to the city. Um, and that's where we agree that there was a nexus. And, and really this does go hand in hand with that transportation planning. If you're looking at the future of your transportation and your corridor, you want that to match with what your zoning is and you know, you allowing the right uses and developing the roadway in the right way. So we looked at these as really being complementary to one another. And you know, for those reasons, we, we recommend awarding a grant in the amount of $50,000 uh, for the zoning analysis. Any questions for Joe on this one? Comments? I'm seeing no. <clears throat> It doesn't mean lack of interest. That means straightforward. Okay. Okay, and then the last one um, is Malden, uh, another application from Malden. Uh, they're looking for $100,000 to perform a feasibility study to redevelop the old Malden District Court building into an arts center. So the city would like to develop this arts center as an anchor institution that would help support local businesses um, in an area that they're calling the, the Malden Center Gaming District. Um, so this area, a number of uh, businesses have opened up there um, that include things like escape rooms, esports gaming, tabletop gaming, billiards, and things of that nature. Um, now, the city is, has stated in their application that Encore has had a negative impact on these businesses. Um, you know, we did ask the city if they could provide us with any you know, sort of documentation of any kind that would really sort of make that connection. And they really were unable to do so, um, you know, partly due to COVID and other things, but, um, you know, absent. Um, so basically, you know, the review team was not convinced that the city made a nexus between this project and the casino, other than sort of a general statement that an impact was occurring. Um, now, the other issue with this project is this, the city does not yet own the building. Um, DCAM has listed the property as available surplus and has filed legislation to that effect. Um, but at this time, it hasn't been determined what the cost of the building will be to the city and how the city will pay for it. And the indication was that this would require some additional legislation to be filed once that's been determined. Um, the city did uh, say to us that they expected to take possession of the property within six months. But essentially, um, you know, given the uncertainties around the ownership and the lack of a nexus to the casino, uh, the review team feels that this application really is just, you know, premature. 
and, and does not recommend awarding a grant to the city of Malden for this project. Um, you know, it might be better, you know, next year to come in, you know, assuming they get possession of the building, that might make more sense at that time. But right now we just thought it was premature. And with that, I will open up for questions. Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, I would agree that it's premature and um, possibly, I know um, with one of your training programs, um, give them some information on how to maybe make a nexus, uh, or, you know, obviously just be able to articulate it better. You may have some suggestions for them. So I agree with the team on this one. And, and the uh, fact that they don't own the building, is that part of the premature now? Okay, thanks. Commissioner Zuniga? Yeah, I think that's the, the aspect that, uh, that does it for me as well. Um, it is potentially a key input in a feasibility study. You know, the conditions, terms, or what have you relative to owning that building that would make a feasibility study, you know, that much uh, worthwhile. So it all it all comes down to uh, the timing, in my view, and, and that's why maybe we tell them to try when they know more in a future year. Sure, Brian. No, I agree. The kind of you had me at premature <laughs> when they didn't have access to the building yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we're all stuck then on. Um, okay, so that recommendation with respect to Melbourne. Okay, so let me just, I'll just do the quick run through on the community planning. Um, so Lynn, the marketing plan we just talked about, um, the Malden Broadway zoning we talked about, um, and then the other one was the Northampton that we talked about at the last meeting. So those are the ones that we are recommending. And then we have the uh, one that we are not recommending, which is the Medford, uh, excuse me, Malden uh, Art Center. So there's three in all, Lynn and Northampton, you're making a rec affirmative recommendation and Malden, you're de re recommending to decline. Well, we're recommending Lynn, Malden and Northampton. Malden is the Broadway zoning. Oh, and I'm sorry. We're, and we're not recommending yeah. the uh, Malden Art Center. Oh, sorry. I. I <laughs> I, right. I, one recommended one is not. Yeah, thank you. At the Arts Center. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the award of the following grants from the Community Mitigation Fund pertaining to community planning um, to the City of Lynn and award for $100,000 for a marketing campaign um, to Malden. Uh, $50,000 for the Broadway Zoning Improvement Analysis, and to Northampton, $75,000 for the Northampton Live Initiative. These grants are for the purposes described in the memos in the Commissioner's Packet and submitted applications, as discussed both here today and on May 6, 2021. And further, the Commission staff be authorized to execute grant instruments commemorating the awards in accordance with 205 CMR 153.04. I second that motion. Thank you. Any further questions for Joe and team? All right, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you, Tanya, for zero. And finally, Madam Chair, um, I move that the commission deny the application to the Community Mitigation Fund by Malden for the request pertaining to the study of turning the uh, former Malden District Court into the Arts Center. Second. Any questions, comments? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Uh, yes, four zero, thank you. That concludes all of your presentation today, correct, Joe? Indeed it does. Okay, well, um, I am going to ask for just a five minute break before we move on to the um, quarterly reports. I, I need to open some doors in my house because it's getting warm. Um, 
and, and get some water. I don't know if anybody else feels a need, but five minute stretch, and then we'll move on to our two quarterly reports. Correct, Joe? Yep. Okay, thanks. Five minutes and we'll reconvene. Right. Next up, we have uh, the Encore Boston Harbor uh, quarterly report for the first quarter. We have with us Jackie Crum, Senior Vice President and General Counsel, and Juliana Catanzariti is the Executive Director of Legal uh, to do their uh, quarterly report for us. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jackie. Great. Uh, Juliana, are you able to share the PowerPoint? I can, yes. Okay, thank you. Let's see. I've got one standing by if you have technical difficulties. Oh, there we go. Can you see? Yep. Okay. Let me just. Okay, sorry. While Juliana is doing that, I'll, I just want to let you know on the prior discussion, uh, we met with the city of Malden last, a couple weeks ago, and had a great discussion about their gaming di district. It's really fantastic what they're doing there. And I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunity for collaboration. Excellent, well, thank you, Jackie, for that. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Juliana. Um, sure. So, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners. It's nice to see you all again, albeit virtually. Um, but we will start with our uh, gaming revenue, taxes, and lottery sales for the first quarter of 2021. Um, let's see, the monthly totals are provided in the table, but our total gross gaming revenue for table games for um, the first quarter was $51,147,252. Uh, the total slots gross gaming revenue was $72,828,463 um, for a total gross gaming revenue for the first quarter of $123,975,716. Uh, and this resulted in state taxes of $30,993,929 being collected. Um, here we have a year-over-year -year comparison in the first quarter of 2020 which, um, as we all know, only went through March 15th due to the mandatory COVID closure uh, as compared to the first quarter of 2021. Next, we have our lottery sales for uh, the first quarter of 2020, of 2021, excuse me. Um, in January, we had total sales of 230,487, uh, February 186,552, and March 196,538 for total um, Q1 lottery revenue of 613,578,000. Here's a year over year comparison of lottery sales for the qu first quarter of 2020, of qu first quarter of 2020 as compared to the first quarter of 2021. Um, the percent change from tw the same quarter for 2020 to 2021 was uh, minus 13.3%. Um, Jackie, I think we'll turn it over to you for the workforce. Okay, so if we can just go to the next, there we go. Um, so on our uh, employees, um, we went up to 55% for minority employees compared to our goal of 40%. Uh, we did go down one percentage point on uh, the number of women. And in, in anticipation of some questions that that might raise, um, I went and looked at uh, the total uh, I'll, I'll, all of our data about that. So essentially we lost about 400 employees between January and uh, the end of May of this, uh, to date. So uh, for a lot of different reasons, uh, involuntary or non-involuntary attendance issues, uh, other infractions, policies, uh, some personal reasons, a lot of people relocated, a lot of people took uh, jobs in different industries. Um, the good news about that is of that, we lost uh, fewer females than males, so you'll see that percentage uh, come up again. The other thing I wanted to let everyone know uh, is that we are actively hiring. So we've got, uh, let's see, about 45 positions that we're hiring for. 
Uh, we're looking to fill over 230 jobs and we have uh, the remainder of those 400 jobs that we lost already in process for onboarding. Uh, we're consistently looking for jobs in security, uh, cage cashiers, cocktail servers, food and beverage, every part of food and beverage, uh, and uh, always dealers. Any questions on that? You might get questions at the end, Jackie. Okay. So then we turn to the uh, operating spend. Uh, in the first quarter, we were able to uh, exceed our goal for minority business enterprises. We had a goal of 8% and we spent 15% uh, for 2.1 million. Uh, veterans business enterprises, we uh, did not hit our goal of 3%. We were at 2% for 272,000. And uh, women business enterprises, we were continuing to try to seek uh, new women, uh, women's business enterprises to increase our, um, to try to obtain our goal of 14%. This current quarter, we were at 8% spend. Uh, the total diverse spend was 25%, uh, which was our annual goal overall. And going into the local spend, uh, oh, just, just before I move on from that, from the uh, operating spend on diversity, I wanted to let you know that we have on a corporate level engaged a VP of diversity and inclusion for the company. Uh, she should be starting shortly and we're very excited to get her on board and to uh, have her lend some assistance to us uh, in this area as well. So moving on to our local spend, uh, this is something that we continue to work with the cities to try to reach the annual goals that we have established as part of our surrounding community agreements. Uh, we're doing pretty well in Everett. Um, the other communities we have reached out to, for example, uh, as I said, we met with Malden a couple of weeks ago. We've asked them to help us identify some potentially new businesses that have come into the market uh, or to try to grow uh, our spend with the current businesses that they have. Um, also very excited to, uh, we launched a gift uh, certificate or gift card purchase program. And we just purchased uh, almost, I think we're up to about $30,000 worth of gift cards from local restaurants. It's so our attempt to try to help the local restaurants in our uh, host and surrounding communities. So we, we were able to spend about $2,000 per restaurant and uh, purchase about 70 to 80 gift certificates uh, from those restaurants. They were all very excited. And I want to thank the cities, uh, particularly Everett and Malden, for working with us to accomplish that. One vendor we wanted to highlight, this is uh, during the first quarter, we placed an order of about 378,000 in promotional merchandise uh, from, this, uh, from this woman business enterprise. And uh, in anticipation of a question, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, uh, they are located in Pennsylvania. Moving on to compliance. Um, during the first quarter, we have the January, February, March monthly breakdowns here, but um, there was a total of nine minors intercepted on the gaming floor that were prevented from gaming. Uh, we had two minors intercepted gaming, one of which was intercepted at a slot machine, the other of which was intercepted at a table game. Uh, we had one minor intercepted consuming alcohol. Um, there was a there was a total of seven IDs not checked that resulted in minors entering the gaming floor and three fake IDs were provided by minors that resulted in them entering the gaming floor. Um, the average length of time spent by a minor on the casino floor or by minors on the casino floor was 30 minutes. The longest length of time spent was one hour and 56 minutes and the shortest was one minute. And Juliana, do you want to explain why this doesn't necessarily add up correctly? Um, sure. So if you if, if you try to total these numbers, they don't make much sense. Um, there are two reasons for that. One is that a certain minor may fit into more than one category. So a minor could be intercepted both gaming and consuming alcohol, um, which would which would force one person to be included twice, essentially. Um, and the other discrepancy for this quarter in particular is a result is um, you can see in the last column, if you look at the number of um, fake IDs provided by minors resulted in a minor on the gaming floor. Um, I think the month is for February, it was zero. The number of IDs not checked was two, but the total number of minors was three. And that is because um, one minor actually presented their um, 
their real ID that was that indicated they were a minor and that minor was permitted on the gaming floor. So that would be that discrepancy. Um, and just to follow up, if I guess to anticipate any questions there, that that security officer was disciplined and ultimately ended up being terminated. Um, that would be the, the security officer that permitted the entry of that minor. Um, a quick promotions and marketing update. Uh, we are very excited to be named um, one of the best hotels in Boston by Travel and Leisure for their March 2021 um, list of best hotels in Boston. And also for March 2021, Boston Magazine included our rare steakhouse on a list of the best steakhouses in Boston right now. Um, two very exciting, um, I guess, acknowledgements for us and two lists that we are happy to be a part of. So on the special event, uh, this one is uh, dotting the I's ceremony in celebration of the Lunar New Year. Uh, you may recognize our CEO, Mad Maddox, and uh, Allison Rankin is our property chief financial officer. They, uh, they were actually dotting the dragon's eyes on a lift, and then we did a very socially distanced dragon dance as well, with the dragons literally scooting through the casino as quickly as possible and getting out the back. But it's a way to, um, to awaken the dragon. We're also very pleased to open cheese, meat, wine. And actually, this plate looks pretty paltry compared to what I've seen served. So uh, we'll have to get a better photo. But uh, it's been really popular, well received. There's a wait outside uh, every, almost every Friday and Saturday night. So uh, it's really going well. This was in the uh, space that was formerly the Oyster Bar. And then finally, we were very excited, very happy that uh, we were permitted to open crafts. And uh, I think about an hour after the commission approved that, uh, we cut the ribbon and uh, the dices were rolling. So thank you. It looks like you, Jackie. I got the, uh, yes, I was given the honor of cutting the ribbon. So. And then, um, as you're aware, we opened a vaccination site in, uh, with uh, Cambridge Health Alliance. So they're running the site for us. We were very fortunate to have uh, Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, and Secretary Sutters come over a few weeks ago uh, to do their press release. They did a tour of the vaccination center, and then they did a press release from one of our ballrooms. Everyone liked that chandelier very much, so we thought we'd both <laughs> feature it. Um, this has been a huge benefit to us in terms of getting our employees and their families vaccinated. So we, uh, we were one of the first vaccination centers to allow walk-ins. And so people could literally just go up, uh, sign up right then and there. And uh, we've, seen, we've seen really good traffic through there. And we've also launched Back of House, a, uh, a campaign trying to encourage all of our employees to get vaccinated. We're trying to make it as easy as possible uh, you know, featuring our, our actual employees uh, to really spread the word and try to get uh, information out about vaccinations. One of the things that we've just launched in the last, gosh, last three or four days is any employee who shows us a vaccination, uh, a vaccination card, if they're fully vaccinated, they, uh, they get a gift certificate. So HR has been handling that this week and uh, our numbers are, are really good for three days of collection. And finally, we opened uh, Night Shift Brewing Kitchen and Tap. This is uh, a local brewery from Everett. Uh, they were really pleased. They uh, essentially, it's, we're featuring their, their beers on tap in, uh, in this location and uh, their name. So that was the excitement for quarter one, first quarter. <laughs> oh, I do have one more thing to show you. Uh, Juliana, would you mind unsharing your screen? Oh. I will share. This is just kind of a fun one. Here we go. So we completed yesterday the installation of our new Ferris wheel. So you may recall the carousel that was there beforehand. And now we have a new flower installation. Let's see the place. So we invite everyone to come and take new selfies by this. That's great. Any questions for Jackie? Commissioner Chair, if I may. Yeah, Commissioner oh. Kim. Oh, that's uh, 
first thing for Juliana, um, I, just a slight drop in the lottery over the last three months. Any reason for January, February, March? Any identifiable reason, or is it just a small sample to really make? Yeah, I, think, I don't think we have an identifiable reason. I think it's it's just a sort of random occurrence. Okay, thank you. And for Jackie, Jackie, um, excellent work with uh, hiring a VP of diversity and inclusion. And um, I think you've been working with certain commissioners a long, long time. You are anticipating <laughs> questions. Um, but I do like the, you were proactive on drilling down on the, the women and what those numbers are. I mean, you, you really can't identify a problem or fix it unless you drill down and, and realize what it is. So um, thank you for that. Um, and I love the vaccination campaign. The graphics are great as well as the incentives. So really, really innovative. Thanks. Thanks. And on the, uh, on the employees that have left, so uh, we're able to, we do exit interviews. And so mm -hmm. we're able to establish the reasons uh, why they're leaving uh, and try to group that. So if we do see a trend, whether it's by department, by uh, gender, by uh, race, uh, we can actually track that. And uh, the good news is to date, we haven't seen uh, a single department or a single gender being disproportionately impacted. Excellent, thank you for that. I was just gonna uh, um, uh, also thank you for the presentation, uh, Jackie and Juliana. What, um, I'm curious, where is the night shift brewing? Um, what space did he occupy? What was there before? Uh, that was Waterfront. Okay. Very similar menu to what Waterfront had. Uh, it's a new name and uh, a lot of different options for night shift beers. Right. Great. And where, where is um, the new wine, wine and cheese uh, offering? Where, what was there before? Oyster Miami. Bar. Oyster bar, okay. Right. Yes. So they actually carve the meats and cheeses uh, to order, right? You know, in that space where they were chucking oysters. Yeah, yeah. I'm due for another visit to Angkor now that things are changing as well. Sure, Brian. Um, I, I did. I I know our definition of minor is under 21, but do you have the breakdown of? truly a minor under 18 versus 18 to 20 in these numbers? I'm almost positive they were all 18 to 21, 18 to 20, um, but I can get you the actual breakdown. Okay. And then do you know any more details about the what, person who was there for almost two hours? Was that the person who showed ID and got let on or how, I mean, that's a long time. Um, I can find out. I do, I do, I think that may have been that person. Yes. Um, and most of the most of the minors that were put on the gaming floor, they're usually t twenty birthday in a month or two type situations, um, from what I've seen anyway. Um, but we can get you more information on that particular situation. Yeah. And then Jackie, in terms of the the women numbers, um, I would assume that part of this too is not only is there a trend for people out the door, but I know things like security is traditionally harder to get women into, and I assume you've got an initiative going to try to figure out how to recruit more women into some of those roles? You know, it's fairly balanced, actually. So between the, between the cocktail servers, you know, in, in every orientation that I've done in the last few weeks, we've seen a very even number of cocktail servers, security, uh, cage, and dealers. So, and, and they seem to vary in terms of gender. So I think we're, we're on track to at least get back to where we were, if not improve it. Okay. And do you know what, what was the number for Q1 2020 before the pandemic in terms of the women? It was it was 53 percent. And I don't know the actual. Sorry, 43 percent as opposed to 42 percent. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. So we, we want to we're trying to increase that irrespective of, of what we see happening. Okay. And then over under on someone trying to actually ride your Ferris wheel. Uh, I would uh, I'm giving it four or five days. <laughs> I was gonna say, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> it has not happened yet. So uh, there, I don't know if you could- That'll see be an interesting on the, video. On the, on the Ferris wheel, there are little stuffed animals uh, that go around as part of this. And I'm wondering uh, who gets one of those first. <laughs> well, Commissioner O'Brien is getting ready possibly to regulate sports betting. She's 
she's really learning all the terminology here. Yeah. Great. Well, we can hope. <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, the only thing I have for question is, um, I, I am regretting not remembering your compliance numbers with respect to minors from the last quarter. Does this, is this a, are these higher numbers? Can you remind me, Jackie and Juliana? I think they might be a little higher than last quarter. I think we no. had a very good trend for a while. In fact, I think we had zero for. Yeah, I think yeah. that's right. I mean, I, I have to say, when I saw this report come in the other day, I thought, um, <clears throat> Your numbers have been um, really good. So um, I guess I'm recommending that you take a step and pause and figure out what's changed and if it's training or you know, refreshing, um, particularly with respect to you know, how do you assess what a minor is looking like these days. Or, um, but I, I think that probably this commission will be very interested in seeing the trends go back to your original. Um, I, I think we would too. Uh, I know, at least with respect to the to the one, it it was just human error. It came up red on the Veridox machine, and the person just let the person in. So, oh, so, yeah. yeah it, that's and that's the person who Juliana said had been disciplined, and and subsequently is no longer. Uh, with a company, but uh, we have we've we've recently uh, stressed with all of our employees, not just the, the security guards who are uh, letting you know, have the initial contact, but we're stressing the importance of consistently uh, checking for identification, even once they're in the in the building. So whether it's at a restaurant when they order alcohol, when they sit down at a table. So I think that's the that's sort of the second level of protection that we really want to make sure is in place. I know that one of the minors in this particular occasion was using an ID. I don't know if it was a brother or a close relative. And I, I think it was very difficult to distinguish. So when they put it in the Veridox, we call it the toaster, they put it in and it pops up, it came up great. And the person did a facial check and looked fine. But later on it was determined that that person was not actually the person who was holding the ID. Couldn't remember his brother's middle name. <laughs> All right, I, I think that that's fair. So um, we'll be looking at the next quarter with probably a comparison on that. Fair warning, commissioners. Okay. Very nice report. Um, exciting, uh, as always, in terms of the good marketing news that you got. I did happen to see, independent of my work, both of those reports that I knew on core would be, would be, I should be proud and pleased. So it's nice to see it. Uh, memorialized here. Thank you. And, and of course, uh, in terms of the women, we'll just keep on um, uh, looking for an improvement and different strategies that you use to um, bring up those numbers. So. Anything well, further? Oh, sorry, Jackie. Oh, thank you. Juliana, thank you, too. And uh, as always, it's great to see you both. Commissioners, are we all set? And for Joe, with respect to Encore. Okay, um, well next up we have the Clay Ridge Park uh, Casino Quarterly Report. And we have with us uh, North Crown Cell General Manager, uh, Kathy Lucas, Vice President of Human Resources, and Lisa McKenney, uh, Compliance Manager. And with that, I'll turn it over to North. Great, thank you, Joe. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, Commissioners. Plain Ridge Park is pleased to present our Q1 Q1 2021 uh, report to the commission. Dana Fortnoy, our VP of Finance, is out this week on some well-deserved vacation. Um, so I will be covering the slides that uh, she would normally cover. Um, as we look at our gaming revenue and taxes in Q1 of 2021, Plain Ridge generated net slot revenues just over 31.5 million and total taxes to the Commonwealth of 15.4 million. Please note for comparison purposes that the numbers for Q1 of 2020 represent a partial month of operation due to the start of the COVID pandemic in March of 2020. Looking now at lottery sales, Plain Ridge Park so sold over $458,000 in lottery tickets during the quarter. This number represents a decrease of 35.9% compared to the prior year. 
And while this number is down year over year, it represents an increase of $154,000 over the prior quarter. As we mentioned in our last update, the new member promotion that awarded lottery tickets as prizes to new members continued into Q1 of 2021. Going now into our spend by state, uh, the casino in Q1 spent over $172,000 or 36% of total qualified spend with businesses within the Commonwealth. The remaining spend for the quarter is split amongst the several states shown to the right and total qualified spend for Q1 was $478,000, $478,900. As we look at our local spend, unfortunately, less than 1% of all mass spend was with businesses in host and surrounding communities. We anticipate the numbers we report for these two slides will look significantly different for Q2 based on known spend scheduled to occur during the quarter. Moving over to vendor diversity, Plain Ridge exceeded its goals for total diverse spend, minority spend, and veteran spend. The property fell just shy of its w, uh, women business enterprise WBE spend in Q1. As with the prior slide, we expect the spend for WBE to increase significantly in Q2 based on known spending within the quarter. As we look at the breakdown of diverse spend, you will notice a decrease of nearly 62% compared to the prior quarter. It should be noticed noted that the decrease in diverse spend was less than the decrease in total qualified spend. At this point, I'll pass the presentation to Kathy Lucas, who will speak on our slides related to compliance and employment, and then I'll come back at the end to answer any questions. Thank you, North. Uh, turning your attention to compliance, during the first quarter, we prevented 531 individuals from entering the gaming establishment of which 502 had expired, invalid or no IDs. Five were minors and 24 were underage. During the first quarter, we had one minor or underage escorted from the gaming area and zero gamble at slot machines or consume alcoholic beverages. Next slide, please. All employees referenced in this exhibit were current as of quarter one, 2021. We had 266 team members at that point, and that was a decrease of 69 team members from Q4 based on the layoffs we had due to, due to COVID closures. We exceeded our diversity goal of 15% in Q1 at 24%. We exceeded our veterans goal of 2% in Q1 at 6%. We did see a decrease in comparison to our women's goal in Q1. We hit 39%. This was directly correlated to our COVID layoffs. And we have currently posted and are actively hiring for our lounge food and beverage departments where the majority of these positions were held by women and uh, laid off. So we're looking to return those roles. We slightly exceeded our local goal of 35% in Q1 reaching 36%. And the casino again had 261 employees, uh, 200 or 76% were full-time, 59 or 22% were part-time, and the rest or the remaining were seasonal. As we move closer to reopening fully, our commitment to recruiting from community-based organizations that support diversity, veterans and women, um, it's incredibly strong. We're confident that we will return to exceeding and meeting the goal for women team members with the return of the departments that have been impacted by the COVID regulations. We actually have a job fair this Saturday and two more next week. We implemented an incentive program for team members who um, left us and haven't come back uh, in regards to returning in a safe environment. So the incentive is by sharing their vaccine cards, similar to the program we have running for our guests. Um, they will receive um, cash relative, uh, or actually cash, to mitigate hesitancy and safety concerns. We partnered with Sturdy Memorial Hospital and CVS to provide convenient access to vaccination for our team members. 
And again, we have approximately 45 positions posted and we need uh, 60 team members over the, the next um, month or so to return to full, full staffing. Next slide, North. In Q1, you'll see at the supervisor level and above, we have 65 team members. 28% uh, of that is diverse, 5% are veterans, and 38.4% are women, which is actually an increase over the prior quarter. Um, what, what that shows is that when we have the opportunity to uh, either rehire or recall or hire new, um, we have the opportunity to take talented women into those roles. Next slide, Nora. Oh, we're missing a, a slide on the, um, the Plain Ridge Park and Penn Gaming uh, Diversity and Inclusion Initiatives. So um, the, the pictures aren't there, but I'll just share that Plain Ridge Park Casino donated $5,000 to the Boston Pearl Foundation. Um, the Boston Pearl Foundation provides financial assistance to students attending college. Uh, this relationship allows us to support furthering the education of young black women who enroll in fresh, as freshmen in four-year colleges or universities. Um, we, we've partnered with them before and will continue to support them. And then finally, I wanted to share that Penn Gaming launched our diversity scholarship program, where as an organization, we're committed to spending $1 million um, to this program. It is, it's exclusively for the children of team members um, we're heavily invested in the commitment to equity and post-secondary education opportunities for students. Um, Plain Ridge is incredibly proud to share that we do have a scholarship recipient that will be announced on the 28th uh, for one of the diversity scholarships that the organization is providing. So um, we, we look forward to sharing that um, one of our team members' children um, has been awarded one of those scholarships out of that million dollars. North, I'll turn it back to you. Kathy, I want to assure, assure you that the uh, slide is included in the public packet. So. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so that's great news. Thank you. Yep, so that concludes our presentation at this point. I uh, will take your questions. Commissioners, Commissioner, who wants to go first? Oh, no questions. Commissioner Cameron, I see you moving. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I think this question is for Kathy. Kathy, um, so you are pretty confident that the women um, that were laid off will come back or you'll replace them with other women because of the types of jobs? Is that what, is that what you're... Yeah, so if, if you look at the numbers where we lost, we lost in our cocktail servers, our lounge servers, our bartenders, and those were um, highly populated by females in our food and beverage categories also. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, are, we have done really well with this, the, the job fairs in regards to um, reaching out to team members who, who were laid off and asking them to come back to us and also looking at um, the partnerships that we have with the community-based organizations that heavily feature women. So um, we're, we're pretty confident that we'll be able to fill those roles. We have about 60 roles and of that, they're probably gonna be you know, a 60-40% a split on, on women. It sounds like you were proactive. You didn't just post the position, you actually reached out to those former team members yeah. and encouraged them stopped. to come back. Yeah, we, we haven't good. stopped, thank you. We, throughout the process, through, since the, the layoffs, we have been communicating with all of our team members in regards to positions that are open. Um, even if it wasn't theirs, we had um, team members that were in roles that still weren't available come back into other roles. So um, we, we stayed very close to our team members in regards to what's available at the property. That's excellent. It seems like others might be able to learn from that that it, it really helps to stay connected and to encourage people feel welcome and the work you're doing around the vaccine, you're, you're trying to get them to feel safe as well, correct? Right. 
Great, and really good job with the, um, the amount of uh, women supervisors and above. That was a problem a couple of years ago. I don't know if you're aware of that, but it really was. The numbers were not great a couple of years ago, so you've done an excellent job with that. So uh, thanks for being proactive. It does make a difference. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Commissioner Zunica, are you leaning in? Commissioner. Uh, oh, yeah, I got Commissioner O'Brien. Well, one comment and one question. One is to say thank you on your um, the compliance slide for breaking out the minors um, versus the underage. I've been asking for a while, so I, I very much appreciate that that's in there. Um, and in terms of the one minor that was escorted off the floor, any idea how long the minor was on the floor? Uh, yeah, Commissioner, they were um, on the floor for about 10 minutes. Um, they did not gamble. Uh, okay. They did not consume alcohol. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Seneca? Yeah, just, uh, just to comment that uh, now for both licensees that provided the report, there's a very nice and encouraging trends. Uh, incentives for vaccination, rehiring, opening positions, open positions rather, and an increasing trend in terms of uh, obviously jobs, spend, and, and revenues. So. Uh, what a difference a quarter makes and really a year um, but it's really um, it's really great to hear all these uh, updates i agree with that An excellent report and presentation north kathy and i know lisa i think was joining there she is uh, thank you so much um I agree with the trends uh no it looks like there's a challenge with with um with hiring women right now and I agree with um, Commissioner Cameron, you're, you've got some strategies in place and we really um, wish you good luck on that. We'd love to see those, those percentages rise. And then finally, the, the um, excellent slide at the end of your, um, your program. Kathy, I look forward to hearing uh, who in fact um, is recognized. So um, we appreciate that commitment very much. Thank you. Joe. Joe. Um, so that concludes the report of the Community Affairs Division. And now I've got to get back to um, my agenda. I'm scrolling away. Um, <clears throat> bear with me because I had pulled up the uh, presentation to make sure that slide was in there. Um, in terms of the agenda, um, <clears throat> I want to I want to just skip to number nine to make sure the commissioners uh, a addresses in an anticipated executive session. Does anybody have a commissioner's update or new business or other business that we need to look at first? I'm saying no. Okay. So um, PPC, thank you for staying on. Um, <clears throat> I have to read this language into the record, correct, uh, Councillor Grossman? So the commission right now anticipates that we will meet in executive session in accordance with GL Chapter 30A, Section 21A7, to comply with GL Chapter 23K, 21A7, for the specific purpose of reviewing <clears throat> the proposed multi-year capital expenditure plan described in 205 CMR 139.09, <clears throat> excuse me, and any corresponding materials submitted relative to Plain Ridge Park Casino. As discussion of this matter in public would frustrate the purpose of the statute and associated legal authorities. This matter um, is further governed by 205 CMR 139.02, as the information at issue is covered by a non-disclosure agreement. To point out the public uh, session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of any executive session. So um, we do have to have a roll call vote to move into executive session. And then as I point out, we would not reconvene publicly. Do I have a motion? Thank you. I second that. 
Thank you. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zinega. Aye. And I vote yes. That allows us to move into executive session. And so the way that this works virtually is that um, I am going to end our virtual meeting with the public now. We will not be reconvening publicly. And then we have a, a different link to a, a separate virtual room that will allow us to fulfill the executive session's purpose. To all the team, thank you so much for a really productive uh, day. Appreciate it very much. I'll see you, see you next week. Um, okay, so I'm concluding this and we'll see you in our next room. Thank you.